Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Um, I'm happy to adjust the volume accordingly. Um, so welcome to the uh, Wildfire Safety Advisory Board's April 19th, 2023 public meeting. My name is Jonathan Frost, and I'm the advisor to the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about how to participate in today's meeting. We welcome public comment during the general public comment period on the agenda, and if desired after any agenda item. The public may participate and comment remotely by Zoom or by phone. Uh, please note that public comment may be limited to three minutes per participant. <clears throat> so first, participants by Zoom will be placed on mute and listen watch only mode until the public comment portions of the meeting are reached. During the public comment portion, uh, participants can use the raise hand function on the Zoom video conference and they will be um, called upon. Uh, please be aware that participation by Zoom while in the room um, it may cause uh, sound issues, so please mute your microphones and speakers accordingly. Um, please note that the chat is disabled for participants and that we encourage participants to send all written questions and comments to our email address, which is wsab at energysafety.ca.gov. And that's all lowercase. So second option, uh, participants by phone will be placed in uh, mute and listen only mode until the public comment portion of the meeting. Once the public comment portions of the meeting begin, participants may dial star, um, or pardon me, um, uh, pound or hashtag, if you will, to um, when they wish to speak to be placed in a queue by the operator. Um, Let's see, so the relevant meeting materials for today's meeting may be found at our website at energysafety.ca.gov slash what dash we dash do slash wildfire safety advisory board. Um, and there's a dash between each of the, the words wildfire safety advisory board um, slash WSAB dash events dash and meetings slash. Public comment received in writing can be found at energysafety.ca.gov slash who dash we dash are slash wildfire dash safety dash advisory dash board slash public dash comments dash received dash by dash the dash wildfire dash safety dash advisory dash board slash. Um, Rain, I don't believe that we can see the slides right now. Could you bring them up onto the screen, please? Uh, in order to do that, Alex will need to share her screen. No, no, no. Sorry, this is the um, the main PowerPoint for the meeting. Ah, uh, yes. One moment. <clears throat> okay. So um, the, the next portion will be the uh, the roll call. So I guess while Rain is um, getting the slides up, uh, Chair Block, would you like to take roll for the meeting? Sure, that sounds great. Um, okay, uh, my name is Jessica Block. I'm <clears throat> chair of the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. I'm gonna take a roll call for our board members. Um, Vice Chair Fellman. Present. Uh, Ralph Armstrong, he is not present. He had a last minute emergency and can't be here. Um, John, uh, board member Mater. Present. Uh, board member Porter. I know you're there. <laughs> Board member Porter, we say that. we're doing a new thing where we call, where we make sure we've documented officially. Present. Uh, I was having trouble getting off of mute. Yeah, no problem. And then um, board member Seifert. Present. All right, everyone's here except uh, board member Armstrong. Um, should I uh, 
Should I begin? Uh, yes, I'm still taking some time here to pull the uh, pull the slides up, but I will have them up shortly. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'll now call the meeting to order. Uh, today is April 19th, 2023. Uh, this is the uh, second quarterly meeting for the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. I'd like to thank my fellow board members for being with us today and thank our um, Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety Professional, Rain Vasquez, for setting up the remote participation and assisting to ensure that this hybrid meeting works smoothly. Um, yeah, we couldn't we couldn't do all of this virtual meeting without our um, excellent tech support. Thank you, Rain. I'd also like to thank our staff advisor, Jonathan Frost, and our staff um, administrator, Marianne Aguayo, for, you know, keeping hurting us cats and keeping uh, us, us all in line and making this meeting a success. Um, I'd like to turn the meeting over now to Marianne to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Chair Block, um, please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Do we have the slides, um, Ring? I'm still working on it. Hold on. Um, should I hold or I could I could discuss the agenda just without... certainly it'll it'll be just a moment here. Sure. OK, so thank you, Marianne. Um, so for the agenda, uh, we're moving some things slightly out of order from what we published. Um, we'll do a general public comment uh, and then that'll be followed by um, uh, our the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board adoption of our minutes from our February 22nd meeting, uh, Q1 meeting. Uh, then we'll hear an update from energy safety on activities that focus on vegetation management um, led by Lucy Morgans. Then we will hear from the, uh, the energy division of the California Public Utilities Commission or the CPUC to provide us with an overview of the rate making process with some insight on the impact of wildfire mitigation plan spending and on rates and bills. And uh, we're hoping that, that you know this is an educational process, um, an integration process for us on the board. Um, and then we'll discuss the latest research and wildfire regimes in California, and talk about the potential implications for utility vegetation management in the in that light. Um, that presentation will be led by um, board member Seifert, who's um, a PhD fire ecologist, and will overview um, a series of of emerging and existing research on the topic. Um, we'll discuss the we'll discuss that in light of the presentations throughout the morning and then the board will adjourn the meeting. Um, I'd like to open the meeting by saying uh, yeah that we'll be focused on this relevant research on vegetation vegetation management and how what we're learning in this emerging science can inform new and updated regulation. This is just, we're just gonna scratch the surface here and discuss the topic and try to put some, as, as advisors to energy safety, start to think about how some of this emerging research can be turned into concrete knowledge to inform policy um, and inform ourselves of the CPUC rate making process. Um, in addition, uh, as a general update, we'll continue to recruit for the um, for an additional advisor position for a five, which will serve as the second advisor to the board. Um, we'll soon begin recruitment for a new associate governmental program analyst and program project supervisor positions. Um, and although recruitment is scheduled to commence this month, filling the new positions will be pending approval of the state's fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget, but we're getting the vol rolling now. Um, uh, are there, so I'd like to ask the fellow, my fellow board members, um, do we have any opening comments? I'd say uh, just raise your hand if you do. Um, Vice Chair Fellman. Uh, thank you, Chair Block. I just wanted to um, thank you for leading the effort on this meeting to take us in a, uh, into a deeper dive into the subject of vegetation management and express my appreciation 
for board member Cypher to um, put together the core presentation for this meeting. I'm excited to hear today and I'm looking forward to hearing from um, my colleagues on the board regarding their expertise as well in future meetings. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Fullman. I really appreciate your support and hoping that um, this is the beginning of our deeper dive um, activities in our quarterly meetings and potentially informing future workshops. So I hope this is constructive and I hope those listening in, if you have any questions to please participate, um, we appreciate any insights um, and even clarifying questions on the scientific concepts are, are welcome as well. Um, great, thank you, Rain, for the slides. Um, and why don't we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Are there, Rain, are there any public comments on the phone line? At present, there are no hands raised. Okay. And uh, what about on Zoom? At present, there are no public comments. Uh, great. And then, um, Jonathan, what about the uh, Wildfire Safety Advisory Board email inbox? Are there any comments or questions? No, none at the moment. Okay. Um, and again, I'd like to emphasize that public comments are really important to us. And um, we'll just wait a couple of minutes and to see if others are trying, those that are participating can uh, raise their hands as needed or notify us on the phone. Um, we'll just wait one moment. Okay, <clears throat> Jonathan or Rain, are there any additional hands raised or comments? At present, there are no more public comments. Great. Uh, Chair Block, I will mention that um, before we started the meeting, there was an email um, that um, one of the participants was asking if there was a link available to access the presentations um, that will be used at this morning's meeting. Um, so to answer that question, we will be posting um, the slides after the meeting has finished. All of our documentation uh, and our public meetings should be posted on our website um, in the meeting section, right, Jonathan? Correct. Yeah, so these will be accessible slides. Okay, thank you. Moving on to um, the adoption of our meeting minutes from February 22nd, 2023. I'm sure everyone's had the opportunity to review these minutes. Um, are there any edits or additions to the meeting minutes from February 22nd. Many of my fellow board members. I'm just looking to see if I can see everybody. Okay, great. <clears throat> can I get a motion to adopt the February minutes? So moved. Great. Uh, can I get a second? Second. I'll call, uh, oh, Jonathan, will you do the roll call for uh, the adoption, please? Yes. So I call for a roll call vote on the motion to adopt the November 16th board meeting, pardon me, um, the uh, uh, February um, 22nd board meeting uh, minutes. Uh, so Chair Block? Aye. Board member Armstrong is not present. Uh, board member Mater? Aye. Board member Cypher. Aye. Board member Fellman. Or Vice Chair Fellman, pardon me. Aye. Okay, so that is um, five in favor, zero against, zero, um, and technically one abstention. So. Aye. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. And next, Lucy Morgan's program manager um, over the Electric Safety Policy Division will provide an update. Um, Lucy, thank you so much for being here and um, updating the board collectively on um, these initiatives that are um, informing various aspects of vegetation management. Over to you. 
Great, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, quite well. Great. So good afternoon. I'm Lucy Morgans. I'm the Programme Manager of the Electric Safety Policy Division at the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety or Energy Safety. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm here to talk about Oh, apologies, just one technical issue. I'm here to talk about what the policy division has achieved in the past few months since the last board meeting and to provide an overview of what we will be working on in the coming months ahead. So I want to provide you with an update in four key areas. The first is the wildfire mitigation plans, the WMPs. Um, and I want to talk about the status and next steps associated with our evaluation of those. Secondly, I want to talk about energy safety's three scoping meetings. Thirdly, I want to provide an update on the work of our risk modelling working group. And lastly, I'd like to provide a brief update in other areas such as executive compensation, safety culture assessment, and our work to review existing safety requirements. So first, taking the wildfire mitigation plans. So late last year, energy safety issue guidelines for the new 2023 to 2025 WMP cycle. Based on these guidelines, each electrical corporation submitted its 2023 to 2025 WMP to Energy Safety back in February 2023. Energy Safety checked these pre-submissions for completeness and provided electrical corporations a list of incomplete items to correct in its formal WMP submissions. So as of now, we're currently evaluating the WMPs from the three large um, IOUs, so that's pg and &E, Edison and sdg and &E. And we'll be holding a two day public workshop next week on the 27th and 28th to seek public input and comments. We're also accepting written public comments on the large WMPs through May 26 with reply comments due June 5th. The SMJU and ITO based WMPs, so that's the small utilities, will be submitting their plans on the 8th of May and we'll be holding a one-day public workshop. Um, public comments on those, those documents are due on June 29th with reply comments due July 10th. Energy Safety will be busy evaluating all nine WMPs over the course of the next several months. Um, and in terms of upcoming milestones, as set out in our previously published WMP schedules, we aim to publish any revision notices for the large utilities at around the end of June with any revision notices um, for the large IOUs published. Sorry, we aim to publish revision notices for the large IOUs around the end of June and any utilities that do not get issued a revision notice will be publishing, we expect to publish their draft decisions in mid-July. In terms of WMP guidelines development, we've just started our process to develop new guidelines for the 2025 WMP updates that will be submitted by the utilities next year. Now turning to energy safety scoping meetings. So energy safety's review of the 2022 WMPs identified three areas for improvement. All of these areas were large, complex topics where input from a range of subject matter experts would be beneficial. So the three topic areas are utility vegetation management practices, climate change modeling as it relates to wildfire risk and community vulnerability and wildfire mitigation planning. I want to provide you with an update on these three scoping meetings. So, Firstly, the purpose of these scoping meetings is to identify important themes and questions and to discuss and agree follow on activities that will drive forward progress in these areas. And I want to thank those board members who've already invested some time and expertise in helping us prepare for these scoping meetings, most notably the board's chair, Jessica Block, and also Diane Thalman. The scoping meeting on utility vegetation management best practices for wildfire safety was held in early February and the goals of the scoping meeting were to identify and prioritise UVM, utility vegetation management best practices in need of standardisation for wildfire safety and to explore how to achieve alignment among electrical corporations. UVM Practices frequently discussed at the scoping meeting included employee and contractor training, hazard tree inspection and mitigation, distribution right of way management, and notice to customers and landowners. So these were seen as the four priority areas that were identified during the scoping meeting. 
In terms of how we take these areas forward, Energy Safety proposed that each of the large utilities own one, one of these topics and hold a workshop to develop best practices for that topic. This proposal seemed well received and we're currently developing next steps and we'll be publishing this in due course. Our next scope in meeting will focus on community vulnerability and wildfire mitigation planning. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but we published the material associated with the scoping meeting, which will be held on May the 10th at 10 a.m. So socially, as, as a bit of background, socially vulnerable communities can be disproportionately impacted by wildfire and experience more challenging paths to recovery. So together with stakeholders, state agencies and utilities, as well as outside experts, we want to explore what community vulnerability factors are key, how we can best measure them, and what opportunities and challenges exist in applying community, community vulnerability to utility consequence modelling in particular? And furthermore, what other opportunities um, are there to bring community vulnerability into decision making? I very much hope that some of the board members will be able to attend this meeting on May the 10th. The last scoping meeting will focus on climate change modelling as it relates to wildfire risk. The goals of the scoping meeting are to identify the various factors that may be affected by climate change. Um, let me start that again. The goals of this scoping meeting are to identify the various factors that may be affected by climate change that would impact wildfire risks, such as heat, aridity, wind and vegetation changes. From there, with participation from outside experts, including academic researchers, other state agencies and utilities. The aim of the meeting will be to identify how these considerations can feed into the utilities models when evaluating both ignition and consequence risks. Finally, we expect to discuss existing resources and research that the utilities can leverage now as part of those evaluations. The meeting date for the scoping meeting hasn't been set, but we're aiming to hold it in June. And Energy Safety very much looks forward to continue collaboration and engagement on these scope of meetings with board members. Next, I want to talk about the Risk Modelling Working Group. The Risk Modelling Working Group was formed as a result of Energy Safety's evaluation of utilities 2021 WMPs. Energy Safety determined that the utilities must work together on common topics, issues and solutions regarding wildfire risk modelling. It was set up in 2021 and now the utilities, both the large and the smalls, participate in monthly meetings with the large utilities giving brief presentations on each meeting topic. The stakeholders who regularly participate include the utilities, CAL FIRE, MGRA, GPI, CPUC, as well as the WSAB. And the goals of this workshop are to identify where consistency and standardisation are possible. Um, with regard to risk modelling approaches to discuss existing best practices used by the utilities and outside experts, as well as to allow for greater transparency in risk modelling practices. The first phase of the risk modelling working group was from 2021 to 2022, and it ended up primarily focused on information gathering. This year, the working group is starting to identify solutions to potentially integrate into future WMP guidelines. We are currently producing a summary report covering topics discussed in 2022 and topics to be discussed in 2023, and we'll be publishing that in the next couple of weeks. Finally, I want to pro provide a brief update in other areas. Um, so firstly, starting with the safety culture assessment. So the 2022 safety culture assessment reports for all the electrical corporations are expected to be published in the next few weeks. And the 2023 safety culture assessment guidelines have been adopted. So the 2023 safety culture assessment process can begin once all the 2022 SCA reports are complete and published. Moving on to executive compensation. Uh, four utilities have submitted their executive compensation structures on March 13th, and we're currently in the process of reviewing these according to the 2023 executive compensation structure submission guidelines, and we'll be drafting a response in due course. We're also working internally to develop the draft 2024 executive compensation guidelines for comment. And then last but not least, moving on to our um, regulatory recommendations for wildfire safety. So I want to provide an update on this work. We've commissioned a study to analyse existing safety requirements for electrical corporations and to provide recommendations for updates to existing regulations to mitigate wildfire risk. 
this study will assess whether updates to current safety requirements, such as Geo95, and or implementation of new wildfire safety requirements may be necessary to mitigate the effects of climate change and pre prevent utility-caused catastrophic wildfires. So we're going to be holding a two-day public workshop to provide more information on the topics under consideration in this study and to gather initial stakeholder input on these topics. The workshop, the workshop discussion will inform our consultants draft recommendations for updates to the current safety requirements. Energy Safety is working closely with the CPUC on this project and anticipates holding joint workshops with them to further refine the draft recommendations in late 2023. So that concludes my report out. Um, I'd like to close by saying that Energy Safety is very much looking forward to receiving the recommendations from the board in relation to its 83-89 requirements by the end of June. And we are, open, we are open to providing briefings to the board members if they would find this helpful. I very much look forward to strengthening our partnership with the board and collaborating on these important topics moving forward. Thank you very much for your time today. And please do let me know if you have any questions on anything I've spoken about today. Thank you so much, Lucy. I have a question about the um, <clears throat> the the last element uh, that talking about there's going to be a two day workshop to talk about these um, safety requirements and potential updates to uh, Geo 95 and others. Do you have that a schedule for that workshop yet? So we did actually um, publish a schedule. It was um, the workshop was going to be um, next week next Tuesday and Wednesday. However, um, I think that we're actually going to be postponing that workshop and we're going to be setting out um, a sort of public notice announcing that today. Um, and so we're expecting to push that out by potentially um, a month, but we're currently uh, looking at our schedule and trying to decide exactly when we're going to hold it. And this is really to sort of maximize our preparation time and to make sure we get valuable input from the public moving forward. This is the first of, of many discussions on this really important topic. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very glad you could come and report on this because I, you know, I've been aware of several of these events, but I'm not sure the rest of my board members are as plugged in, as in particular mm. to the vegetation management work. So, um, just in summary, want to just reiterate, we've got uh, best practices in utility vegetation management as a discussion, climate change modeling as a discussion community vulnerability as a discussion, and risk modeling to increase transparency and standards and consistency in risk modeling as these things are executed. I think these are all really, um, just really deep and complicated conversations. And our hope to, in, in our discussion today is to, for us as a board to think about how some of our expertise can fit in as advice to these and are looking forward to communicating with you about ways we can best uh, communicate that information to energy safety and support the efforts. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm looking to see if there's any comments in the chat. I think Colin's put a few helpful links in for folks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's to the panelists. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. Really helpful. And that's a, that's a lot of work. We're looking forward to participating where we can. Can you just say the comments out loud, please? I don't think uh, the public can see that chat. And because that's to all board members, can you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Colin sent the, the panelists a uh, save the date link for uh, the wildfire safety requirements recommendations workshop. Um, should we post that publicly? It's a PDF. Let's see. Is that internal, Colin, or is it? No, that's public. That's, okay. I think he's just sent you the website link just so that you're aware. Let me see. Joy, do you yeah. want me to publish it? Do you want me to copy it? Yeah, go ahead, please. Let's see, to everyone. And as I mentioned previously, we're expecting to postpone that workshop. So all the details within it are accurate apart from the date and time. I wish I could delete what I just posted. <laughs> um, that was not my intention. Um, Uh, 
Can Rain, can you help copy and put and paste that uh, energy safety link, please? Certainly. And then to blog, if you want, just take this time and ask if there are any public comments for this section. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so for any of those that are attending um, on the phone or on Zoom, are there any comments or questions that you'd like to pose at this time around uh, what's, what's been discussed so far? Um, Rain, why don't we, why don't I ask you first, are there any hands raised on Zoom? Presently, there are no hands raised on Zoom. Okay. Hold on one second here. I'm just going to. Please hold on one moment here. Um. And Jessica, maybe I can just add one more thing just so that all board members are aware that we're um, in the process of reaching out um, to board members via Jonathan to set up meetings um, in relation to that last item I talked about, the regulatory requirements, recommendations, um, project that we're working on. So hopefully um, board members will be hearing from us to set up a meeting to engage further on that. Excellent, thank you. Um, and thanks, Colin, for posting that new the link publicly. Um, okay, so Rain, no comments online. Um, Jonathan, are in the any or or on the phone, Rain? Correct. Okay, and then Jonathan, do we should we check on email as well? Yeah. So there was an email. Um, so the question um, is regarding the uh, the dates that um, Lucy Morgan's announced for the workshops gathering uh, or for the 2023-2025 WMPs um, that were submitted by the large IOUs. Uh, so the question is to provide the workshop dates um, or point to a calendar of upcoming events or workshops. Okay, I think um, Colin might be able to post that link or if not I can do it once I've finished so yep the workshop notices for um for that work the workshop notice for that um particular workshop has been posted it is on our news and events section on our website and I think um we actually posted a detailed agenda of what will be discussed um at that workshop uh, just yesterday so uh, just to give a brief overview the utilities are going to give um a short presentation on a number of key areas um, within their WMP. Then we're gonna have some panelists um, provide sort of some questions that the utilities will be expected to answer. And then we'll move on to public comment uh, for each of those sections. It's a two day workshop um, taking up the vast majority of both days. And, uh Ms. Morgan, that's on the 27th and 28th of uh, next week, correct? Yes, Thursday and Friday. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morgan, this is Vice Chair Fellman. Will those uh, meetings be recorded in case um, board members want to cannot attend in real time? Yes, they will be recorded and the recordings will be uploaded onto our website. Um, and so I can uh, I can make sure jo I, Jonathan gets a link to those so that he can pass it on to you. And, and that's the same for all workshops that we have all public workshops. We record them and we post them on our website so that if you can't attend, you can always take a look at the recording afterwards. May I uh, just make a call for any further questions or comments from the board? Good 
Great. And uh, I, I'm assuming I don't need to ask for the public comment again, or do I, should I do that? No. Okay. Uh -huh. No. Okay. Great. Well, let's move on to our next item on the agenda. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Morgan, for being here. Um, Paul Phillips from the CPUC Energy Division and his colleague will provide a presentation on the CPUC rate making process. Um, so, uh, Paul, we've allotted 40 minutes for your presentation and we probably could make some room for some flexibility, but um, we are aware that you have many uh, slides with um, lots of content. So uh, we can also, um, we'll just keep tabs on time and I'll give you like a five minute heads up. And if we have a lot of content to continue discussing, we can um, maybe add it to a follow on meeting. Sure. Okay. That sounds really good. And yeah, it'll probably take longer than 40 in total, but I'll try to skim through to the, the most important parts. And then, of course, you'll be able to take the slides with you and we can reschedule for another time as well if you have follow ups. Fantastic. OK, take it away. OK, so is someone else in charge of my slides or there we go. <laughs> or am I sharing my own? Let me share mine. Uh, you should be sharing your own. I just gave you permission. Thanks. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, let me know if you're having any trouble seeing this. We'll try to get through this. So I'm going to provide a bit of a backdrop of kind of where we are in the state as far as like our rates are concerned, uh, what the kind of primary forces that are, um, you know, that are moving rates at this point in time upward and um, getting into some of the mechanics of how we set rates at the PUC. And then I, I will, of course, turn it over to um, Bridget's here and Smith on my staff to talk a little bit about some of the wildfire related um, uh, important uh, issues around wildfire related uh, costs that are driving rates as well, which is, frankly, uh, the primary uh, driver of rates at this point in time in terms of the, the size and scope and scale of, of the costs that we're, we're talking about. So, um, you know, just as, as background. Um, I view this as kind of we're in a we're sort of in a tale of two states as far as affordability is concerned, and many of you are aware of you know some of the affordability challenges that we're having in certain parts of the state, particularly I would say down the spine or in the Central Valley of California. Uh, my staff and I have been doing a lot of forecasting work around not just rates and where they're going using cost and rate tracking tools, but also um, the sort of rate of change of affordability over time over the next three to five years. And so we've been doing a lot of work recently on that that's new using new tools um, to show how this transition is occurring and where the pain points are in California. Um, and again, uh, led, led almost entirely, uh, or the majority of the, uh, the drivers of costs right now uh, is definitely coming from wildfire related spending, but also transportation related electrification spending and um, other you know, capital related investments that are going on uh, to fulfill some of our renewable mandates as well. Um, and distribution mandates, so our distribution related um, upgrades. Uh, so, Paul, would, yes. would you mind uh, putting the slideshow into presentation mode? Uh, that would be helpful. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, Thank so, you. yeah, thanks. Uh, so, household energy costs in general, and this includes not just electricity and gas, but also gasoline, are rising and disproportionately impacting low to moderate income Californians. I would say. Uh, particularly in the hotter climate zones, we're worried about 40% of the state right now in terms of the affordability uh, equation and how it's affecting people. Um, bundled residential rates, meaning customers that are taking full bundled service from our IOUs, um, are, um, have long outstripped inflation, and they're continuing to do so, I think, even in spite of recent um, higher inflationary trends. And so um, this remains a concern. And it remains a concern because we're trying to enable a certain amount of fuel switching in the transportation electrification side of things, right? We want to make sure that customers are getting the price signal that electricity is going to be more affordable in the long run than, um, than uh, gasoline, of course, you know, and so we're, we're moving very, very quickly into an electric vehicle future 
um, in an automated electric vehicle future, uh, autonomous electric vehicle future that we want to work out. And so um, net energy metering and, and what we call distributed energy resource customers tend to be disproportionately wealthier and coastal and not necessarily in the, hot, the hotter climate zones. But it's not surprising that customers with more means tend to invest in um, you know, the energy future that we, that we hope others will be, be able to participate in as well. Um, and conversely, lower income customers are experiencing higher costs of service currently, but we're fixing some of that. Um, our net energy metering policies are moving us in a direction um, and our um, hopefully our rate design policies that we are embarking on, meaning uh, more advanced rates for California will hopefully resolve some of these cost issues. And again, long run electrification, meaning um, decarbonization generally at buildings and, and transportation um, should hopefully in the long run lead to lower household energy costs when paired with more advanced rates that send the right signals and when paired with good technology, such as, you know, next generation programmable thermostats, um, the key, I think, is getting lower income, lower participation customers to participate in the long run. Uh, this is just a chart that shows a bit of the long term trends going all the way back to 2005 um, and into our, our most recent years as to where um, PG&E, Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric rates have been uh, in cents per kilowatt hour. So not surprisingly, they're on the rise. Um, a little bit concerning to see San Diego's rates kind of rising a bit more quickly. We've been having lots of discussions about that. There are um, lots of reasons for that. Namely, <clears throat> San Diego is the smallest of the three IOUs. Um, large investments in capital, including wildfire-related expenditures, tend to disproportionately impact that utility. They don't have the economies of scale that PG&E and Edison have. And so not surprisingly, they also have a lot of departure to solar going on right now. Uh, what that means is that kilowatt hour sales are declining uh, more rapidly for San Diego uh, than for other uh, utilities. And so when you divide the total operating costs over the, uh, you know, the revenue requirement for the utility over uh, by the number of kilowatt hours and those kilowatt hours are shrinking, not surprisingly, um, you know, the rates are rising. So we have work to do in this area to try to shore up um, affordability for our customers. Did you say that there's departure to or from solar? Departure to uh, rooftop solar. So, um, ah. So, right. So, net oh. energy metering tariffs and therefore loss of kilowatt hour sales at the bundled level. Understood. Um, right. So, um, and so uh, individually, you can see where we're going. I mean, this is, we have tools that allow us to see, you know, three to four years into the future based on revenue requests by the utilities, capital needs to fulfill our mandates. And uh, Bridget's here in Smith does a lot of great work in this area and has produced these charts uh, for our annual six, uh, Senate Bill 695 report. Um, you can see that even in spite of inflationary trends, which have been on the rise, that rates are continuing to outstrip inflation at a faster rate. And so, again, concerning and um, needing to do a lot more work in soul searching, I think, internally about how we're going to mitigate these costs in the future. And, and it is, um, you know, I don't know if the I don't know if the uh, alarm bells are going off, but we're definitely very, very concerned at the PUC about how we're going to maintain affordability and again sustain our transition into electrification and provide the right price signal to customers to do so. And Paul, this is all in kilowatt hour price, yep. uh, the, the previous slide? Yeah, correct. So is there a way that, um, that um, you know, as there's more penetration of solar and there's fewer kilowatt hours sold, is there a way to relate, uh, there, uh, that's gonna contribute to the rise of kilowatt yep. hour price because there's a minimum amount of expenditure. Is there a way to bifurcate like in genuine increase in cost versus the smaller bait rate base to pour, to spread the cost over. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think you're asking: Is there a way to sort of isolate the impact of you know departure, solar departure, right, uh, mm -hmm. or unbundled customers uh, generally uh, versus the general increase in revenue requirement? Yeah, we do. We do have those impacts. We haven't done that here. We haven't broken that out separately to show you. But I would say year over year, just and for everyone's knowledge, I think year over year over the past five years, I think, and Bridget can correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say, not, not outside the range. I would say about five to ten percent in um, sales decline for kilowatt hours, as a result of mainly of, of solar penetration, right, in in these territories. And so, it's quite significant when you think about it. Um, you can also think about it in terms of as more and more people adopt electric vehicles, those kilowatt hours will come back to some extent, but not to the total extent, right? Um, and so that that countervailing effect of having more adoption of electric vehicles and greater kilowatt hour sales as a result of that will help, but um, it's not going to completely offset what's been going on with, with solar um, sales departure, but it's a good question. Thank you. 
So we'll keep going here. Um, so we talked about kilowatt hour sales decline as one of the main drivers, and this is the big picture that we're talking about. Uh, we also talked about wildfire related and transportation electrification capital expenses as a primary drivers right now, the top two of uh, revenue requirement rates. Um, and then again, depending on the utility that you're talking about, but mainly San Diego, rate sensitivity to larger capital investments shows up more in San Diego's rates than it does in the larger two utilities. Um, but again, we're hoping that decreasing reliance in the long run on natural gas, um, increasing electrification and, um, you know, upgrades to distribution to support that uh, in the long run, as well as better price signals, meaning more advanced rate designs, including real-time pricing across the system, we hope will lead to the kinds of savings that will offset some of this pain at the moment. Um, and then obviously, eventually we'll hit a certain steady state with regard to the investments in wildfire related expenditures and um, you know transportation electrification so that will level off at some point in the future um, over the next 10 years um let's see i think this is yeah there we go it's got multiple <laughs> multiple sets of talking points here um so the irp refers to um the integrated resource planning process at the puc that includes all of our supply side and demand side investments and um you know just costs, fuel costs, et cetera, you know, what, what our portfolios of energy look like for the, the individual IOUs. Um, the, the big number that should jump out at you is that as you look at the duck curve on the right, we're still expecting if status quo holds currently um, a 60% increase in the evening ramp, meaning that that really difficult period where the, the duck curve, the demand curve for the state is starting to ramp up uh, between um, late afternoon and evening, you know, 4 to 9 p.m., um, as people are getting home from work, as streetlights are coming on and, you know, demand is rising, particularly in the summer. Um, and we think if we don't do something soon to sort of mitigate this, a 15x increase in renewable curtailment, which is causing some of this problem. Um, so I just want to give you the backdrop for why this is really crucial that we, you know, sort this out. And um, some of this has to do very much with um, not just sort of how we um, a lot of it has to do, I think, with with rate design and the, and the price signal that we're providing during the day, uh, but it also has a lot to do with just how we deal with, um, you know, um, peak to off peak pricing. It also has to do with, you know, things like um, how we um, how we make the grid just more efficient in general for uh, customers and um, leverage resources in a different way. So. Um, Creating more demand response opportunities for load shed at the right time is really important, uh, but also making sure that we have a very highly scalable, integrated, low-cost deployment strategy um, for integrated demand response and rate design uh, in order to make this um, a, a little bit of a better outlook for the future. So a lot of this has to do with reliability, and we're obviously concerned about that, stability with the grid, and making sure that you know we're not incurring uh, rotating outages or any kind of brownouts, you know, and, and so putting in the right programs on a scalable level in order to um, ensure that we are uh, addressing this problem. Um, so now we'll get into some of the rates related mechanics. I'll try to, you know, um, not go too fast, but we are running out of time quickly. So let's just kind of jump right in. Um, at the PUC, there are um, two different phases usually for general rate cases for the major investor owned utilities. Uh, the first phase deals with uh, revenue requirement setting um, at, at a high level, the entire operational expenditures that a utility will incur, regulated operating expenses that the utility will incur um, over a three to four year period is usually what we're dealing with. Um, and then phase two is where we take that total, that total pie, if you will, of, of operating revenues that is required by the utility to operate uh, effectively and carve that up and allocate it into different customer classes and different tariffs for recovery. And so that's the rate design phase is phase two. That's a lot of what my team is responsible for. Um, and uh, that we do work very closely with the electric cost team at the PUC to um, you know understand these effects better. So often we have settlements in, um, in, in these uh, both phases of the general rate case, we have also some litigation as well. And increasingly over the last several years, we've had um, a need for, um, for more litigation because our preferred policies as a commission are not necessarily shaking out of settlements as well as we would like, depending on which utility you're talking about and depending on which set of issues you're talking about. And so the commission has, I think, been more um, inclined to go toward litigation of certain issues within uh, the scope of these proceedings uh, lately to um, to achieve certain policy outcomes that are that are critical. 
uh, in the long run. Anyway, we don't need to go through all of that, but just wanted to give you a flavor for how these things work. They tend to run for about a year to a year and a half, sometimes two years between the two phases, depending on how they overlap and how many issues are at stake. But um, they're, they're pretty big proceedings and they're pretty much always happening, right? Even though we stagger them over time to help um, you know alleviate workload on both the commission and on parties. Um, oh, could I ask you, um, yeah. how do these, uh, how can you go to the back of the prior slide? These, how do these um, rate cases get initiated? I, I think I don't understand how these begin and, and. Good question. And, yeah. Yeah, so they're initiated through um, an application process that the IOUs serve on the commission and, and these applications are on a regular now four year cycle. Um, and they're directed to file these applications in each successive decision, right? So for, for the GRC phase one, for the revenue requirement phase, um, there will be a decision that is put out in some year X and that decision will have a clear pathway and directive on the timing for the next uh, submission of the next application by the utility, you know, on a certain schedule. And it will also direct certain things should be included in that application, right? Certain uh, scoping elements that need to be uh, taken up in that application. So, um, and then also whatever the utility wants to, you know, put forth as its request. So um, same thing with the GRC phase two, there are two different applications that come in um, in overlapping ways on an overlapping schedule, and uh, they tend to uh, be staggered both phases and um, they're dealt with, like I said, within a year or two each. Um, so it, it does feel like we're constantly in some GRC cycle, whether it's pg e or Edison or Sempra, there's always something going on with regard to rate design and, and uh, revenue requirement. And the cycle is every four years? Every four years, yep. On one uh, IOU may begin a new rate case. Right, we set rates for four year cycles and then restart the process. Okay. Um, and overlapping timelines. Thanks. Yeah, and so just for your own uh, for your own uh, knowledge here, one one of the key rate making concepts that that I think is really critical to remember uh, that goes all the way back to the '70s and early '80s, which is just decoupling, and you know our, our gas and electric utilities are decoupled, meaning we've broken the link between their revenue and their sales, uh, which is really important. That was really important at a time when you know conservation was critical and wanting to make sure that we weren't penalizing you know, the utilities for um, doing good things with energy efficiency. And, um, you know, so remove that disincentive for, for the utilities and encouraged conservation. It aligns shareholder and customer interests at the same time. So this is a really critical uh, concept that a lot of other states have since adopted, um, not surprisingly. So um, with regard to phase one, the revenue requirement portion of the process, we have different types of proceedings, as we, we've just noted. We have the general rate case phase one that I've just discussed, but we also have the energy resource recovery account or ERA, which is probably responsible for about 40 to 50% of the utility revenues. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment, that specific proceeding. Um, and then we have a bunch of other minor or minor to major cost applications, cost recovery applications that the utilities will submit to the, to the uh, commission, um, including an evaluation of their public purpose programs like the care and fair programs or, or specific transportation electrification needs, uh, distribution related upgrades, you know, these sorts of things. And so I just wanted to give you a flavor for those types of applications that would be submitted, either directed on the commission's own motion or, you know, submitted ad hoc by the utility for different needs that need to be met. Um, so often it's the commission that's directing the play on that. Um, so the phase one and the era the general rate case phase one and the era proceedings are really the most important pieces of the rate case or of the determination of the revenue requirement for the utilities. Uh, and here we talk about the, that cost determination as the, the, the first big step uh, when it comes to the GRC phase one. Um, and then again, my team sort of comes into play around the um, rate design application or the phase two application in which we um, determine what the marginal cost of services. We divide costs up and allocate the revenues or, or costs to different customer classes. Um, and then we, within those customer classes, um, assess where revenues are going for different tariffs. And so we'll talk more about that. Um, again, these proceedings are not just the general rate case phase two. There's also a little intra GRC um, application called a rate design window that usually takes up, you know, more minor rate design issues in the middle of the four year cycle. Um, and then it's really important to keep in mind as well that the other rate design piece of this is um, determined exogenously at the federal level by FERC. So that's for transmission, which is inherently interstate. 
and therefore follows that it would um, be uh, dealt with by FERC. We do have a team at the commission that um, participates in FERC proceedings for transmission related rates and, and advocates on behalf of California. So um, we talked about the revenue requirement a little bit more here. We, you know, we, we talk about it as the total size of the pie for operating revenues. Um, often it's focused on two really key categories, which are just basic expenses, one-time expenses, such as salaries, buildings, vehicles, predictable operations. And then the larger things that get amortized over a longer period of time are capital investments that, that earn a return on equity. Uh, this is where the utilities earn their, um, their return for their uh, shareholders. And um, you know, there's a, there's a whole cost of capital proceeding that determines what that equity structure looks like, that debt versus equity structure looks like. We'll talk just a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and I know we're going to run out of time before I can even get to the wildfire stuff, so I better hurry. Uh, anyway, we um, we talked about the settlements. We don't need to talk anymore about that. Um, with regard to the era proceeding that we just spoke of, uh, the, the scope here is often dealing with fuel contract purchases, power purchase agreements, market costs, um, qualifying facilities, payments, which are, you know, slowly working their way out of the system. That's an older, I know, form of procurement that I think is eventually going to um, phase out. Um, greenhouse gas emissions credits, natural gas uh, related contracts and all of that. And these are put through without markup, utility earns no uh, return on equity or markup or profit or rate of return on um, these expenses. These just kind of go through. And so, like I said earlier, this is about 40 to 50% of the total regulated revenue requirement, depending on which utility you're talking about. Um, now we move into, you know, my area of, of specialty here, which is really more the gen general rate case phase two. Um, we're allocating the total revenue requirement amongst our, our customer classes. Once again, um, commercial, industrial, agricultural, residential, street lights is its own class, um, and small commercial um, is also its own class. So um, this is generally the case for all three of our major utilities. Um, and then we go ahead and, and once the marginal cost is assessed for the cost of service, um, and the revenue allocation is done, we end up with kind of new adjustments to rates. Sometimes these phases also result in, or take up, I should say, um, new, uh, new, new tariffs and rates entirely, new classes of rates, um, things that might be more geared toward um, more, you know, more advanced rate designs to help enable electric vehicles, for example, um, to enable different types of more flexible end uses for customers. And so that's kind of increasingly where we're going is uh, much more advanced rates. We've gone from very static inclining block rate designs into time of use rates, which you now are probably pretty familiar with at the residential level, but also across the entire system. And then now we're dipping our toe in the water of um, you know, much more advanced rates, real-time pricing, dynamic pricing uh, that will be much more economically efficient in the long run, given all the needs that we have for the grid. Um, so some basic principles here around um, utility costs, rates, and bills. Uh, just to remember that you know the revenue requirement is the cost of service, the total cost of operations, um, plus the rate of return that the utility is allowed to earn, the profit, uh, that, that is the, the total revenue requirement. And then the rates themselves are that total revenue requirement divided by the kilowatt hour demand or the kilowatt hour sales, as we've been saying. Um, and then your bill is your rate times your usage, right? Your kilowatt hour sales uh, at, the, at the end of the month equals your bill. So this is kind of a, a nice handy uh, guide for, for basics here. Um, just for a moment, wanted to spend a little bit of time on what it means to earn a, a, rate, a rate of return on rate base <clears throat> for these IOUs. Um, this really revolves around the big big driver of, of rate base for the, the uh, investor and utilities is capital additions or capital expenditures that get put into rates over several years and get amortized and accumulate depreciation. So things like, you know, even a, a transmission line, which would be like the biggest piece or a, um, a new power plant or um, uh, new forms of distribution that, that get upgraded, you know, physical capital equipment. <clears throat> and so the utility is allowed to earn usually anywhere from like five to 7% on rate base as a rate of return. And you can see what that kind of looks like in terms of the numbers below for pg e Edison and San Diego. And you have different, um, you know, you can see the trajectory over the five years uh, from 2016 through 2020, what the percentage increase on average was. Um, so steadily their, their, earning, their earnings are increasing steadily as a result of these capital additions and the earnings that they're allowed to get for their shareholders um, as a, a rate of return on rate base. Okay, and then this is also you know, relevant and, and related, but 
within the ROR, within the rate of return that is determined by the commission um, in these rate cases, there is a large element called the return on equity, which we just referred to a moment ago. The return on equity, I, I can't give you the exact percentage uh, size of it as it relates to the ROR, but here you have some numbers that show you the different the, the capital structure uh, that supports um, ROE. You know, uh, you've got your your common stock, which is the the vast majority of the ROE, and then you've got long term debt as well and preferred stock, and then you have this kind of overall cost of capital that is determined out of all of these factors. And usually the debt to equity ratio is somewhere around 45 to 55 percent, um, you know, for each utility somewhere in that range in that neighborhood. And, and therefore, you have this kind of final number that represents the rate of return on rate base in the seven, seven and a half percent range for, for the three, the four utilities that you see here. Listed. Can you go, could you, would you mind going back one slide, please? Sure. And can you, can you repeat the punchline for this slide? So this slide is, um, the punchline is, and let me just move my, <laughs> move you guys out of the way uh, on my screen yeah. a little bit. Uh, so I could just, yeah. So the punchline is, this is the rate of return that the utilities are allowed to earn um, on rate base. And so this is factored into the GRC phase one, the revenue requirement. It is a part of the total revenue requirement that they're allowed to collect. Um, it is essentially the dollars that they earn on invested capital in the system. Okay. And, um, you know, there's a, the return is assessed based on the next slide, right? It is the comprised of debt and equity. It is comprised of the rate of return on equity, as well as the debt that is serviced by the utility. And so it's, um, it's a little bit complicated, but the bottom line is that this is what we've determined. They are allowed to earn through our cost of capital process. And, and it ultimately leads to earnings for the utility that translate into dividends for their, their equity shareholders in the long run. So it's, it's a reflection of their profitability and it's not bad actually, given where the market's been lately. It's a, a pretty predictable, um, stable, you know, a form of earnings for these, these companies. Right. So we can, and, you know, happy to come back and talk more about all this. I know there's a lot and we're trying to get through a lot here. Um, this is more on this, more on, um, what the authorized return on equity looks like. Um, you know, not that long ago. ROE, again, a reflection of the earnings for uh, the, uh, the return on equity, the returns that will come to shareholders uh, for common stock um, were, were as high as 11.5 to 12%, not that many years ago, actually. And then what we've been realizing is that, well, California's ROE is a lot higher than most national utilities. And so we've been slowly bringing it down in line with the national average. We also want to be clear, though, that ROE or ROR and ROE, which are, you know, part and parcel, um, <clears throat> are reflections of market risk that California utilities face. And in some cases, due to wildfires and other exogenous factors, that market risk is higher, that operating risk is higher, you know, so therefore the ROE would reflect price that risk in and uh, reward uh, shareholders accordingly. And so you can see, though, just in this table below how, um, you know, even just a half of a, you know, like 0.55% ROE increase, you know, let's say from 9.5 to 10% can have a, a rather large impact in terms of what that translates into into millions of dollars for each utility. So just something to keep in mind that it does make a huge difference uh, in the total revenue requirement. Um, we know that customers pay bills, not rates, right? They don't really pay attention to rates often. That's just something to keep in mind. Um, we don't need to spend any more time here just knowing that noting that electricity usage is the major billing determinant, um, which is not surprising. Um, also another key concept, which I think you're familiar with is that we have these baseline territories in California or, um, you know, climate zones that reflect, uh, different, different, uh, baseline allocations, uh, needed by different customers, usually driven entirely by weather and appliance saturation appliances, mainly being, uh, the main appliance being, um, air conditioning. So air conditioning load often determines, uh, the amount of, uh, average baseline electricity that we determine uh, for a particular climate zone or baseline territory is reflected on this map. This is just pg and territories. You've got some in Edison territory as well, and you've got four in uh, San Diego territory as well. So this is just um, a fair allocation of baseline electricity, which is priced at a certain level um, to meet the needs of customers in hotter climate zones or cooler climate zones. So for example, um, I think it wasn't that long ago and it's probably changed, but maybe a couple of years ago, San Francisco's um, baseline electricity quantity in um, in its territory was somewhere around um, 
seven kilowatt hours a day, you know, of baseline electricity. Whereas in Fresno, it was more like 17. So just giving you the, the kind of the differences between uh, climate zones there that reflect those needs. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Bridget to discuss our next section. I know we're running out of time very quickly. Bridget, are you ready for that? Actually, yeah. I thought you were going to handle this. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll yeah. handle it. Sorry, I, I was I was I'm here in case there's questions. <laughs> do jump way, in though. Do jump in. Way, I'll probably mess this up. Paul uh, and Bridget, we have more time because we sort of skirted through the beginning of our meeting a little bit faster. So, um, you know, we can go till like 10:55. So we've got okay. quite a bit of time. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Um, okay, so I'll try to do my best here. I think Bridget is the uh, the true um, you know subject matter expert on. Um, well, for mitigation. Well, well, now that we have more time, maybe I'll do it. It's just that you were going at such a good clip. I thought maybe <laughs> we'd be able to get through them faster. Okay. Um, if you want, I can go ahead and, and handle it. Um, go now for it. Go for it. And I'll jump in if needed. But I think you're oh, the okay. you're the one. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. So um, we're looking at a graph of um, the large IOU WMP actual spend. Um, and the wildfire mitigation costs that are in rates. So um, we know that there's a lag because there's regulatory lag, right? You know, there's a time lag between the time that costs, uh, costs uh, occur and when they're actually approved and actually implemented to rates. Um, so when we're looking at the WMPs, we see the, the the costs that are projected, but we're we're unclear about when those actual spend um, will result in approved costs, when the cost recovery will begin after that approval, and how long the recovery period will be. So there's just a lot of questions when we're looking at the WNP costs. We're not really sure at the outset how that's going to actually. Um, play out uh, as far as costs going into rates. Um, and then for the actual costs that are in rates, which are the uh, lines in the chart, um, you can see that uh, as of 2020, none of the three large IOUs really had much in, in, in rates. Um, so all of a sudden, around 2021, we see some movement, PG&E and SCE. And uh, then we see some leveling off for PG&E in 2022, and we see continued growth for, for uh, Edison. Um, so I've provided a couple of reasons on this slide why that could be, but uh, this is just a good example of what, it, what we mean by saying we don't really know uh, how these costs in the WMPs are going to manifest in rates. Next slide. So when we look at the um, wildfire mitigation plans, um, like I said, we're not really getting an idea of what's going to hit rates. Um, we need a data request the utilities to get that information. And I do that in the context of the um, Senate Bill 695 report, uh, which talks about um, recommendations that the commission might make to reduce cost and rate increases. So we compile a lot of information under that heading in, in the report um, related to wildfire. And um, we now have four years worth of data, 2019 to 2022. You can see in the dark green shaded areas of the table, the sum of um, all of those years and what we consider to be the total wildfire related costs, which would be the sum of the wildfire mitigation costs and the total wildfire insurance or sort of liability related costs. Um, and we note that the IOUs now forecast the majority of their WMP costs in their general rate cases. However, they may also request them in a separate application, uh, particularly when, when we're talking about record balances in memorandum accounts. Um, 
And then uh, for PG&E and SCE in this, in this table, the costs include um, their A, B, 1054 securitizations, which are equity rate-based exclusions that uh, were statutorily required. Um, and these um, rate-based rate -based exclusions uh, were uh, excluded from earning a, a return on equity. So it was a little help for rate payers. Uh, the difference between paying a return on equity and paying a return on debt, such as in a securitization, uh, can add up to be substantial. So this was this was a little boost for the rate payers uh, in AB 1054. Um, and then as far as the liability, the wildfire insurance, uh, catastrophic events, um, the IOUs are allowed to recover certain wildfire related costs that are external to the activities described in the WMP, such as insurance premiums and um, catastrophic event costs. And then AB 1054 also created a wildfire fund for excess liabilities resulting from utility caused wildfires. And that is funded equally by ratepayers and utility shareholders. AB 1054 uh, has a lot of provisions. I'm not sure how familiar this board is with, with uh, some of those provisions, but these are some of the two major ones, the AB 1054 equity rate based exclusions and the uh, wildfire fund. So um, there could be additional costs that are not reflected in this table, certainly, because these are costs and rates that um, could be like, for example, recorded in memo accounts that we'll see show up in rates at a later date. Uh, next slide, please. Again, Keeping in mind that we're looking at what's actually hit rates. This is the wildfire related revenue requirement in rates at this time, um, shown and subdivided into um, the wildfire related operating expense, capital related um, revenue requirement, and all the rest, which is the, the large area, the green area, the non wildfire related. And we can see for the blue and the red, um, starting about 2021, we're starting to get some pretty significant amounts showing up as a percentage of the total revenue requirement. Uh, I was going to jump in, and this is a really important chart just to see the magnitude and the, the creeping magnitude of, of welfare related, mainly operating expenses, as you can see, but some capital as well. And also important to remember or note that San Diego began its wildfire related investments a lot sooner. So, I mean, this goes all the way back to, I mean, I can recall being an advisor back in 2011 when they were really kind of ramping up after the witch Guajito um, fires down south. And so they've they've covered off a lot of expenditures already, but still have more to go. But is, that's, you know, their their relative quantity is a lot smaller, as you can see, because of that. Right. That last bullet at the bottom says uh, uh, San Diego has been revamping, enhancing its wildfire prevention and mitigation measures since 2007. And the uh, wildfire related revenue requirements may reflect a, a mature wildfire safety program. Um, so it's important to remember when we're looking at this slide, particularly with respect to the, the red, the capital related, you're not seeing, you're just seeing little slivers there. And that's because uh, in any given year, only a fraction of those capital related costs convert to revenue requirement. And that would be a reflection of the depreciation expense as the under, underlying asset depreciates and um, the authorized profit on the net capital investment that's paid yearly. So some of these assets are quite, quite long lived. They can go out um, 30, 40 years. So you're just seeing sort of a cumulative buildup effect over time for that red shaded area. Um, Again, it doesn't look like much right now, but it will it will build up over 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 time. Um, so in twenty as, as, as I was saying in twenty twenty one, we started seeing some significant wildfire related operating expenses beginning to appear in rates. Um, I've got some figures there. Um, you can see at the end of year twenty twenty two. 
the percentage of wildfire related revenue requirement to total revenue requirement for each utility is about 23% for PG&E. Um, for Edison, about 12, and San Diego, about nine. And just to be clear, these are billions. So, you know, total revenue requirement for the big two utilities is, is huge. And uh, excuse me, this is uh, Vice Chair Feldman. So, um, Bridget, what is, or Paul, what is the uh, reason that PG&E has such a higher proportion of wildfire costs in its rates? Um, I'm not really sure our cost recovery, uh, wildfire cost recovery experts not on the call today, but, um, you know, it's just, I don't know, maybe they're, uh, they've got just a, more they need to do, right? Um, yeah, I, I think was very proactive. They actually started even before their first 2019 wildfire mitigation plan was published. Um, they started their grid safety and resiliency program, which they started in 2018. And so they were actually looking ahead and saying, what can we do? And I, and I believe they've always been sort of like that. They've been very proactive. Um, and then of course, in 2019, Governor Brown signed SB 901, and that's when all the wildfire mitigation plans started coming out. So I, you know, I can't really answer your question, Vice Chair, uh, precisely, but that sort of gives you an idea, uh, maybe, um, of the difference between the two utilities. And just to be clear, we, you know, we were trying to get someone on the call who was a little bit more, was closer to the ground on, on these types of expenses on the welfare mitigation plans. And so unfortunately she's out this week, but, um, but yeah, I, I think the bottom line is that PG&E identified needs that were greater, you know, or started launching into them sooner. And uh, Edison, so, Edison, I'm sorry, Edison, excuse yeah. me, I'm looking at Edison, not, wasn't the question about PG&E though, as to why PG&Es are the highest? Yes. Well, in comparison to Edison. Yeah. Right. So um, these I, are I, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so, sorry, Chair Block. I, I think the fact that we for the last four years have examined uh all three of the IOUs, we understand that PG and E by scope um has the most work to do. Uh, it's it's got the largest uh, area in the uh high uh high fire uh threat areas. Um they are actually looking at doing more than just, I think, covered conductor and and uh, 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 fire resistant uh, composite poles. They're looking to do a lot of undergrounding, and they've taken on a big Herculean task. I, I think that that is that would be a simple explanation um, for why their costs are are greater. Or, or yeah, definitely I think that's right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the but these, these actually only reflect costs that are in rates. So all of that yeah. undergrounding stuff is hasn't even shown up yet. Right. Um, but yeah, as far as costs in rates, they probably have a larger scope um, of their current work. But do I understand these as wildfire recovery expenses? So post wildfire, is that what that means by wildfire recovery? So in the GRCs, they're actually forecasting what their costs for wildfire will be. Um, but at the same time, they've got these memo accounts that have been accumulating costs that are recorded costs, they're historical costs, they're not forecasts. So they're recovering both. They're recovering sort of these projected costs that they're gonna think, they think they're gonna incur under the WMPs, as well as playing sort of a catch up for all of these recorded costs dating back to 2019. Yeah, one example would be, um, you know, and this is my lack of <laughs> specific knowledge of what it means to harden the system, but, you know, like specific distribution related costs that they're gonna recover going forward that they're planning ahead through these WMPs to uh, proactively recover. Uh, and then there's the backward looking, oh, we've already had some disasters that we're responsible for, some service extension issues and like, you know, Santa Rosa, and then you think about their service territory and how massive it is from the, the Oregon border all the way down to Kern County. And it's just so not that surprising to see that they have a lot to. Uh, and then they've also been the most risky utility uh, in, in recovery. So, you know, a lot to a lot to unpack there for sure. Good questions. To be continued.
This is just, yes. I think, our yeah. first conversation. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for coming today because this is um, something we've been um, interested in and now we're, we're getting the um, information we need to understand it. There's one more slide which will show you the impact um, rates. So when I say impact, I really mean the portion of rates that's attributable to the wildfire related um, costs. Uh, again, everything, all these slides are sort of related. These rates are, and bills are coming from that revenue requirement that we saw on the previous slide. And this is for year end 2022. So kind of the worst case scenario of all the years that we saw previously. Um, so we can see here that uh, for the bottom table, the bill, um, tw about $29 worth of PG&E's $167 per month bill, or about 17% is, is due to wildfire related costs in rates. So that's wildfire mitigation as well as wildfire insurance and the wildfire fund, everything, everything wildfire related. 17% for PG&E, 10% for Edison, and about 9% for San Diego. And these, so, these are bills for um, customers not enrolled in care, um, lower income customers would see a lower bill, about 65% um, 60, of this bill. And, and so, um, I just noticed that this does not include CCA customers as well, is that correct? These are what we call the bundled customers. So it would be the full service utility customers. They receive generation and delivery services. Right, and so to, to be clear, the, the CCA customers are paying a different generation charge for a different portfolio that the CCA is, is procuring for them. So that's the only difference. It is a major difference, but um, so they, they still pay, those unbundled CCA customers will still pay the distribution and transmission charges that you see reflected here or that are embedded here, I should say. So, so all this information is in the annual SB 695 reports in some form or another. Um, some of these tables I prepared, especially for this presentation, but um, the basis of all of this information is in those annual six, uh, SB 695 reports. Yeah, if you if you want to dive deeper. Right, and, and by the way, that 695 report, we'll have a new one for May 1st coming very soon. So it'll be published um, you know, very shortly here. Uh, we're wrapping it up as we speak. I know we're running out of time, so we don't need to dive into all of this, but if you, you know, just letting you know there's more information on, you know, how to unpack what the rates look like, what, what the rate design process is like, it does get very technical. Um, if you want to dive that deeply, feel free. If you want us to come back and talk about it, we can do that. Um, but if you, yeah, so just putting that out there, I know it's almost 1055 now, so we'll probably need to leave it here. Yeah, this looks like the slide I wanna uh, take slow and steady. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay. I think I, I have a lot of questions, um, but I think digesting for myself first might be a, might be a good choice. Um, I wanna open it to the rest of the board. Um, for additional comments and questions from, or, um, you know, review uh, anything that the board would like to discuss. We have a few minutes. Well, um, when I'm thinking about the slide where you're, you, you presented the, the in, you know, uh, increasing operating costs, wildfire operating costs, and um, I'm understanding that in that slide, you're, you're capturing um, some of the costs uh, for the damages, for damages payout, that's part there. It, is, is that amortized going forward as well for previous, uh, previous fires? Is, is that going to, uh, like even if like there were a miracle, there's no more fires, no more damage, uh, is, is that going to be embedded in rates? Uh, because I don't see how it's possible inside the blue column, the blue columns here, uh, for the total costs of damages to have been uh, captured. And, and so we, it's not like it's paid for already. 
previous damages. It seems like this will right. continue to so it's you. it's the insurance premiums. So it's not mm -hmm. the actual payouts. It's mm -hmm. the premiums that the IOUs pay for the insurance that's going to pay out. Um, the third party claims are uh, they're complex. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on it. I know that the, this is shareholder related as well. So it's not going to show up in rates in the same way. It is going to show up in insurance premiums. It is going to show up in uh, operating expenses and capital invested to restore service to areas that were affected by fires like camp and you know Santa Rosa and all of that. Um, and as Bridget, I think, alluded to earlier, these things are carried forward in what are called memorandum accounts. The utility can book these costs and then get recovery, get revenue, get a reasonableness review done by the commission in a rate case and um, recovery later. Right. But the third party claims thing is, yeah, that's a bit more complicated in terms of responsibility, you know, the utilities responsibility for that and who pays and shareholder, you know, shareholder penalties around that. Understood. And I just have a quick follow up on that, um, Mr. Phillips. What, when well, you mentioned reasonableness review, and just in the short version, because I know we'll have a longer, we'll have some uh, processing to do on this and probably more questions later on, but how does the um, WMP, the certification of the WMP by energy safety fit into the GRC reasonableness reviews? or whatever proceedings you have for those. Right, so you're asking how are the memorandum accounts reconciled ultimately for these things? Yeah, yes. um, so my staff is not directly overseeing that particular portion of it, but I can tell you that um, typically, you know, the, the commission can look at these expenses in any rate setting proceeding, but often in the GRCs where um, reconciliation evaluation by a cost team that we have in energy division, We'll go through and verify that the expenditures were sound, that they were um, in the public interest, et cetera, et cetera, that they meet, you know, the obligations that the utility had been, uh, the parameters that were set forth for these types of expenses in the governing legislation or decision, right, that, that drove it. So um, typically it's going to happen just like we did. So balancing account, memorandum account review will occur um, usually in the general rate case phase one by staff that's a lot more qualified to audit those things than I am at the moment. So, <laughs> you know. And closer to the ground. Bridget, is there anything I'm missing there? Yeah, I just want to make the distinction between the costs that are already recorded and that are um, sort of piling up in these memor memorandum accounts versus the GRC, which is a forecasted cost, right? Where the um, utility will take the WNP um, and some other things like um, their risk accountability reports and make these projections on what they think the cost will be over the next uh, four years. So you've got both. You've got the projections for the, um, the majority of the costs, and then you've got, you know, how did we deal with these costs that have already accumulated since 2019? And as we move further on down the road, um, I expect that there'll be less lag because we'll have taken care of a lot of those 2019 plus um, recorded costs. They'll all kind of just sort of be taken care of as we as we um, move down the GRC road. And we'll be mostly looking at GRC and then maybe some cost overages that the, the utilities may incur, which would be recorded in um, those uh, memo accounts. Any other questions? I think we will have a long list of questions as we digest and get into our next round of conversations, whenever that may be, maybe our next board meeting. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your time. Uh, Chair um, Block, before we end public yes. comment. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, Rain. Are there any um, public comments on Zoom or the phone. At present, there are no public comments. Okay. Jonathan, anything via email or otherwise? No, not at the moment. Okay. Thanks, Joy. Um, okay. Again, uh, 
Mr. Phillips, and I don't know how to, how, is it Siren Smith? Ms. Siren Smith, thank you so much for being here and for the review. We really appreciate your time and we look forward to following up and having deeper conversations um, in the near future. Uh, let's take a five minute break. Um, I'd like to make it just a seven minute break so that we can <laughs> we can digest and stretch. And um, so let's come back at 11.07 and we'll continue then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Let us know how we can help. In the Thanks so much. Appreciate Bye. it.
Hi, everybody. Let's um, I'd like to start to ring the bell here for those to return. I'm here. Great. And I see board members Porter, Dalman, Mater. And ciphered. Okay. All right, we shall resume. Okay, so we're going to resume this meeting by discussing some of the latest scientific research as it relates to the topic of utility vegetation management. In particular, things we can learn from research in fire ecology. Um, we're considering writing some thoughts up around what we can learn in this research towards um, potential recommendations to some of the working meetings that are occurring in energy safety, as well as how they might feed back into some of the rate making processes. So these are broad and open concepts that we're going to start to think about as a as a board. Um, and I've asked uh, board member slash Dr. Seifert to present um, a suite of her work um, and knowledge in the space so that we can start to uh, think about that in this context. Um, let's see. Um, so I believe, unless I'm missing anything, I can hand it over to uh, Dr. Seifert. Let's do that. Okay, so um, board member Seifert, take it away. And um, I think, so we are supposed to sign off at noon. I say, um, oh, you're muted, by the way. Um, I kind of liked how we did with um, the CPUC conversation that we sort of inserted ourselves with questions. So I, if that's okay with you, Alex, we might continue to do that. And then, but let's save uh, some time at the end for conversation as needed too. So, um, Take it away. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. And can you see my slide? Yes. And not anything else, just my slide, just making sure. Um, there's a little uh, bit of a window overlapping on the left. Like oh, I see that. Yeah, let me see if I can move that over without. Okay, now can you, now is it clear? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Chair Block. I This is going to be a general talk today. I've been studying and doing research on wildfire for almost 25 years, focused mostly in California, but also in other areas around the world. And I don't know how many of you are from, are from California. I'm not from California. I grew up on the East Coast. And so when I when I was growing up, California to me evoked all of this strong imagery. Uh, and some of it was really good. I thought, man, there's the sun and the sand and surf, the movie stars, there's all those beautiful national parks. But then, you know, there's also bad stuff with California. You've got the traffic and the freeways and there's earthquakes there. And of course, California is where all the wildfires are, right? And, um, you know, California wildfire is a thing. It is a cultural phenomenon. There are books about it, movies about it, um, songs about it. This is my own Spotify playlist for songs about wild um, wildfire in California. And I hear now there's even a TV series about fire in California, which I haven't seen, but um, kind of scares me. I don't know. Anyway, somewhat like the state, California wildfire is a good thing. It's uh, especially recently, there's been a lot of movement to bring good fire back to the landscape. It's good for indigenous people, cultural, per cultural burning, uh, restoring nature. But, you know, it's also a bad thing. Smokey the Bear is still relevant. And now lots of times when you see movie stars on the TV, it's of their houses burning down in wildfires like they did in the Woolsey Fire in 2018. And this, of course, has been getting worse, as you all know, with multiple 
fire events in just a two year period of time that accumulated into more than 40,000 structures being destroyed. Um, the worst of which, of course, being the campfire. And if you look at a trend of structures destroyed over time, this is um, clearly a problem since 1920 that's becoming a lot worse. And California serves sort of as a poster, filed for, poster child for wildfire issues across the globe. And so everyone is looking to us and what we're gonna be doing about wildfire. Um, and there's urgent questioning. Everybody is asking, well, what do we do about this fire problem? And as a scientist, I have been studying um, for a long time the, the question of, well, before we know what to do about it, how do we understand it? And the thing about fire, it's not only is it a good thing and a bad thing, but it's also a complex thing. Um, just the subdisciplines of fire ecology and fire management have their own completely different methodologies. They have different vocabularies and jargon. And adding on to that, to understand wildfire, you also have to understand other fields. It's very interdisciplinary, including meteorology all the way through to public health. So I'm gonna provide three basic lessons of things that I've learned studying wildfire over, um, over my career, particularly focusing on what are the main drivers and what are the consequences of altering fire regimes across the state. And my first lesson is that wildfire is a geographical issue. Now, a lot of times people call it a forest fire. Um, a lot of people think that California has a forest fire problem. And these are just three random screenshots from media articles that I took from the internet. And they're calling all of these fires forest fires. But in all three of these fires, there was no forest that burned at all. They actually, um, the vegetation that burned was non-forested vegetation. And this is partly because the most extensive vegetation type in California is not forest, it's actually um, woody shrublands, our chaparral ecosystems, our herbaceous ecosystems. And if you look across the entire Western US, a lot of the areas that are burning aren't in forest. Um, the forest areas here, of course, being in green. And um, this also just being a recent map showing you the distribution of where wildfires have um, been occurring with the larger wildfires in the larger circles. And so a colleague and I recently did a really simple experiment in which we overlaid uh, the fire perimeters from a 20 year period of time on vegetation type map of California. And we just simply calculated the proportion of area that burned in different vegetation types. And you can see, um, looking at both conifer and hardwood forest, um, you know, they're not the largest area that's burning. It's actually, of course, in um, chaparral shrublands. This did not include, by the way, the year 2020. So there's probably more forest that's in these percentages now. But we also took something in which we called any fire in which at least one structure was destroyed a destructive fire. And then any fire that did not result in a structure destroyed was a non-destructive fire. And we looked at those by vegetation type. And so you can see the vast majority of fires um, where structures are lost, destructive fires are not in the forests. They're actually in the shrublands of California. And so what is it about G um, wildfire being a geographical issue? Well, the first thing to understand, and, um, and I, I will explain this in case any of you do not know the concept, which is the fire regime. And that's in fire what we call um, the characteristics of fire within a given region that occur within a characteristic range of variability, meaning they're variable, but only within a certain range or bounds um, over time. And this is what ecosystems are evolved with. And this is the fire is part of ecological systems. And so the different frequency, severity, size, et cetera, of fire, um, they, are part of the historical fire regime. And in California, we have a wide range of different fire regimes, ranging all the way from those that historically had very frequent fire, where the systems evolved with this frequent fire, all the way to deserts where historically there was not very frequent fire at all. 
And the geography of wildfire, it really comes about because we have extraordinarily diverse topographic conditions in California. We have diverse land cover types, diverse climatological conditions. And, um, and when you look at a map showing you where fires have burned historically, there's a clear spatial pattern. This, of course, being, um, you know, areas where uh, some places have burned 14 times were in the same time period, other areas nearby haven't burned at all. So certain areas of the state have just historically been more fire prone than others. And uh, in a recent experiment, a uh, colleague and I defined eight distinctive fire regime ecoregions across the state of California. But despite this variability, I'd like to call your attention to two very broad distinctions that cause a lot of confusion for folks. One of these is the um, conifer forests that I was talking about. These are areas that historically had, um, these are like dry, dry forest types. And uh, historically, there was very frequent low intensity surface fire in these forests that would typically come through burn through the understory um, and not very often reach up into the crowns of trees. But chaparral shrublands, on the other hand, historically lightning ignitions were very rare. And so the natural regime for chaparral is to burn very infrequently. And when it does burn, it tends to burn in very high intensity crown fires where the natural regime is to kill all of the above ground vegetation. And then the vegetation responds through different kinds of um, adaptations to fire or disturbance. And what's happened in the last century or so is that these two different kinds of fire regimes, broadly speaking, have been altered in nearly opposite directions. This map you're looking at is called a fire return interval departure map. And it's showing you the current frequency of fire relative to the fire frequency that was estimated pre-Euro-American settlement. So in blue areas, these are areas that have skipped fire cycles. They have, in recent years, had a deficit in fire frequency. Um, and this is largely because fire suppression efforts have been very effective at keeping fire out of these forests that um, we often call F4 ecosystems, formerly frequent fire forests. But on the other hand, in the shrubland areas, there's been uh, tremendous human population growth and urban expansion. And this has increased fire frequency to the point that it is now far beyond what was historically there. And so there are now many ecosystems experiencing excessive fire. These fires are much more difficult to exclude, in part because a lot of these are wind-driven fires that are difficult to suppress. And in both cases, when you change a fire regime relative to what it um, was adapted to naturally, it can result in profound ecological transformations. So we've got threats of our forests being converted to shrublands, and in turn, we've got threats and already documented um, extensive evidence of conversion of our shrublands to exotic grasses due to high severity fire. Um, this map, if you're wondering, on the right is showing you um, it's sort of a perfect natural experiment in where the background only burned one time, but with increasing fires, you can see that the one that had a two year interval between fires has now been completely converted to invasive grasses. <clears throat> a little bit of discussion about the, me um, the mechanistics behind how this happens. Um, I talked about how there's been exclusion of fire, low understory fire in a lot of the dry mixed conifer forests. And what's happened is that because of that, there's been a lot of growth of vegetation underneath of shade tolerant species that um, are not very fire resistant. And as these stands become denser and denser, they're competing for resources with the other trees in the forest. And so that just creates a situation where there's a lot more drought stress. And when trees are stressed by drought, it makes them very uh, 
vulnerable to insect attack and mortality from bark beetles. And so, as we all know, we've seen tremendous dieback of a lot of our forests in recent drought years back in 19 or um, 2014 or 15 or so. And so on top of tree mortality due to drought stress, there's also now an increasing risk that fire regimes are becoming uncharacteristically severe. And this is because whereas the surface fires used to not um, kill the larger old trees because they were resistant to low intensity fires, these, this infilling of the vegetation is creating situations in which the latter fuel can get up into the trees and cause large high severity fires that kills those trees. And so the second part of the equation is that um, with post-fire regeneration, it's much more difficult, one, because if you have large patches of high severity fire, it's more difficult for trees to be able to disperse in and regenerate. And even if they do, with climate change, uh, recruitment success is much lower than it used to be. A lot of trees are no longer have no longer have the conditions that are needed for them to be able to um, establish in Germany. And now on the flip side, to talk about what's happening in the chaparral, uh, just a little bit of background on the ecology of chaparral species. Even though there are many hundreds of different species that fall into the vegetation formation of chaparral, um, there's three different post-fire response strategies. 60% um, of the floristic diversity of the chaparral species are known as obligate cedars. They only recruit in response to fire, meaning they require fire to regenerate um, through fire cued seed germination. The thing about it, though, is that after a fire comes through, cues the seeds to germinate, it can take up to decades for that plant to then mature and replenish the seed bank before another fire comes through. On the other hand, we have species that are called obligate resprouters. They don't have fire cue germination. They just resprout vigorously in response to fire. And we have facultative cedars that have the capacity to do both. Um, and what's important to realize is that for all species, they have very low recruitment rates in general, very short dispersal distances. The seeds pretty much just fall right below the tree. So once chaparral is extirpated or eliminated from a site, it's very hard to reestablish it. It's probably gone at least within our lifetimes. And so the premise of the type conversion is that with increased human caused ignitions, difficulty suppression fire, we're from being able to regenerate. And you live in California, so you know anywhere that there's a disturbed place on the landscape, it's going to be colonized immediately by all of our um, invasive herbaceous species. And those are dry for most of the year. They're very ignitable, very flammable, and therefore they can bring even more fire to the system, which then uh, threatens more chaparral, which then creates this positive cycle that we often call the grass fire cycle or the invasive fire cycle. Um, we wrote a paper where we actually reframed it as the human grass fire cycle because, of course, humans cause more than 95% of the ignitions in California and open up the landscape, allowing for the colonization of these um, flashy fuels. And my colleague and I have done uh, a lot of research in the last 20 or so years, trying to understand why and how and where this uh, vegetation type change has been occurring in the chaparral. And um, to not to take up too much time, we have found uh, through air photo analysis, looking at change over time, that there has been very extensive conversion of chaparral to invasive grasses. Um, anywhere in these orange areas in the map are places where there's been a loss of chaparral or woody cover to um, grasses or complete conversion. Um, although the uh, rate of decline and conversion varies based on region, this is just basically showing you um, in the South Coast region of Southern California, even within the region of California, there's been much more um, loss of native chaparral. 
And when we do experiments and statistical analysis of why, you know, what, what are the different correlates that explain why chaparral is being converted to grasses, short interval fires um, in all of the regions of Southern California tend to be the most important region, but environmental context is also important. There are certain areas in which chaparral is even more vulnerable to being uh, eliminated due to short interval fires. A lot of times this has to do with dry conditions and there's increasing research now that there are drought fire interactions in chaparral, specifically for these obligate cedars where when, when conditions are very dry, it makes them even harder to regenerate after fire. So this is also tending to facilitate the type conversion. Another interesting thing we found that I won't talk too much about is that the vulnerability of individual chaparral species, in other words, you know, what is the minimum interval you need between fires to be able to have chaparral persist? And it varies depending on what species it is. And in the last couple of years, my colleagues have been doing field work across the state of California, taking areas that have recently burned and burned across different age classes of chaparral and looking at the recovery at different ages or different intervals between fires. And this is just one example here in San Diego County. The number that's important is the seedlings per pre-fire shrubs. Um, in a mature stand, it's a lot higher than it is for an immature stand at 14 years old. But the other thing that's important is that we've been doing this not just in Southern California, but looking at obligate seeding chaparral across the state. And we're finding that short interval fires are causing the decline and elimination of obligate seeders in other parts of the state as well. Um, here's a case in which um, in an eight-year-old stand in Monterey County, um, none of these three species were able to survive. They were completely eliminated from the site and they were um, substantially knocked back at 12 years old. So what this is saying is that Southern California is where we've had so much fire. That's where we've had so many minimum intervals between fire. This is why we've lost so much of the chaparral, but it's possible um, to have this happen to other chaparral species as well. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this. Um, to summarize about the first lesson is that the environmental diversity in the state is what leads to diversity in natural fire regimes where fire is a part of the ecological process. And so the, the systems are adapted to different types of fire. And when that is altered, it can lead to profound changes in the ecosystem that in turn can affect fire in the future. And this varies geographically. Another lesson is that fire regimes are changing for many reasons. Um, a lot of people are really worried about climate change and fire. There's a common assumption that there's just a monotonic increase of fire with climate change. Everybody thinks that fire, that climate is going to make fire much worse in the future. And of course, you think, well, hotter temperatures, drier conditions. This seems kind of compatible with wildfire. But um, my colleague and I have been looking at climate fire relationships in smaller geographical areas in California, where we look at a long history of wildfire and relate it to seasonal variation in climate, like seasonal temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure deficit, different variables you would expect to be related to fire. And um, on the one hand, in this chart that you see on the top right, this is the Sierra Nevada, we found highly significant relationships between seasonal climate activity and fire activity, like you would expect. Um, and in these regions, climate change is likely to worsen fire, at least for the short term before vegetation conditions completely change. But what was interesting is that in Southern California, we found no direct relationships between wildfire and seasonal climate activity. And you know, you might think, well, that's odd. How is it, how could climate not be significantly related to, to a fire in California, in Southern California? And part of the reason is that every year, 
is a bad fire year in Southern California, relatively speaking. In the summer, the temperatures can be really hot. If you look at this chart, you can see that the low mean summer temperature in Southern California is the same as the high mean summer temperature in the Sierra Nevada. And with our Mediterranean climate, we've got six months of drought every year. At the end of the summer, the fuel moisture is just about as low as, as it's gonna get. Um, and so we've got very low fuel moisture, very hot conditions every single year. And every single year, we get the regular occurrence of Fane winds or Santa Ana winds. So all you need is an ignition and you've got all the climatological conditions necessary to have a bad wildfire. And this isn't to say the climate's not a concern, it's just to, to suggest that climate can have different kinds of effects. One of these can be indirect, uh, to the extent that climate may be increasing prolonged droughts. We found evidence that long-term drought in Southern California can lead to a lot of dieback of vegetation. So when there's a lot of dead vegetation, this can make fires become faster more quickly in wind conditions because they're the embers are flying, you know, and catching fire from one dead tree or one, you know, dying shrub to the next. Um, and also indirectly through vegetation change. Another thing is that uh, there's been a lot of relate uh, research, not just California, but across different areas. And they're looking at crime, I'm sorry, climate fire projections. And in some regions, climate change is expected to increase fire. But in other regions, climate change is expected to result in the decline of fire. So it's not, it's not a simple story. Climate is not increasing fire everywhere. And I decided to take this type of analysis across the entire United States looking at climate fire relationships historically within different subregions, and found a similar thing that we did in California and that different regions have different types of climate fire relationships. In other words, some variables, uh, some climate variables are more important in some regions than others. And there's a different strength of relationship. And so I asked the question, well, why? Why are there some regions where there's very, very little relationship between climate and fire and other regions where it's very strong? And we found when looking at a range of uh, factors we thought might explain it, the only one that was significant is that those areas that have weak fire climate relationships are those areas that have higher human presence within them. Um, the weak areas being the lighter green lower variance explained um, of climate and fire in these areas. And so humans can affect fires in multiple different ways. They start fires, they put them out, they change um, the continuity of vegetation, they, can, they change the um, type and conditions of vegetation. But the important thing to consider is that in some regions where there are a lot of people, the human influence on, on wildfire can override the effect of climate and therefore, when you're trying to predict fire in the future, it's important to consider what this human influence is. Um, I had mentioned before, humans do cause most fires. Uh, in California, the lightning strikes are generally in the farther eastern and higher elevation areas of the state. Some interesting work that we've also done recently is we, uh, from 1948 to 2018, we looked at a range of variables to try to understand what is the most important factor that explains area burned and Santa Ana wind-driven fires. Uh, the first interesting thing we found with this is that 75% of Santa Ana wind events don't have a fire. And a lot of people, they, they focus on fire weather and they're like, oh, they're looking at the increase or decrease of wind conditions. But the thing is, is that just having a wind does not necessarily mean you're gonna have a fire um, because you can't have a fire if you don't have an ignition. And corresponding with that, we found interestingly and surprisingly that more than daily weather conditions, more than seasonal climate before the um, fire, the number one variable significant re significant re significantly related to area burn in Santa Ana wind-driven fires is the number of ignitions that happened on the day of the fire, in addition to wind speed of the Santa Ana wind. And 
some other research I recently found that I think is really interesting is that they found that actually human ignited fires result in more extreme fire behavior and ecosystem impacts than lightning caused fires. And you think, well, how could this be so? You know, it's an ignition. But the thing is that because human ignited fires are now happening all year round, and lightning fires tend to have a certain season associated with them. With there are severe fire weather conditions that are, you know, could result in extreme fire behavior, human ignitions, just numerically speaking, increase the odds that an ignition is going to occur at the same time and place as these bad weather conditions. Um, now, Humans or utility companies, obviously, they don't need to worry about other people causing ignitions. But when you're doing um, risk assessments and when you're trying to think about patterns of future fires and assumptions of when and where and how fires are likely to occur, it is important to think about um, where human ignitions might be occurring in the landscape and where those fires might be coming from. And one final thing about this is. We're doing some work right now trying to understand what are the most significant variables associated with those super, super large fires that occurs. These are fires that are larger than 10,000 hectares. And we've been looking at variables um, for these across the entire state. We've also been looking at what are the drivers explaining um, fire size in summer versus autumn. And the point of this slide is just to say that for any given one large fire, there are numerous things that are coming into play at the same time. It's a synchrony of events. And you know you can see that um, short-term weather conditions, stuff that's going on the day of the fire, um, Palmer drought severity index, these are conditions leading right up to the fire, um, vegetation conditions about a month before the fire, all the way through to seasonal climate, annual climate, all of these things are combining to result in this extreme fire that we're all worried about. Um, so in summary of this lesson, and my last lesson hopefully will be shorter, um, it's important to consider that climate is a concern for future fire, but not to forget about the fact that it's not always just climate. Human impacts are also affecting fire. And there's other factors affecting fire as well, such as fire suppression and management effects, insects, invasive species. And then finally, to consider co solutions that can have co-benefits. Um, with all of the fires in California, there have been urgent calls for solutions, as we all know, um, seeking solutions to a wicked problem for California wildfires. And most of the money in response to these um, calls has been allocated to vegetation management. Billions of federal dollars are headed for forests to manage them. Cal Fire is slated to spend um, almost $3 billion in the next three years, the majority of which is for vegetation management. Um, to the extent that this is going to be going into forests, this kind of matches the, the, the perception that we've got a forest fire problem. But um, as a reminder, most of the structure loss is not happening in forests. And now vegetation management in forests is a win-win situation. This is a solution that can have co-benefits because as I explained before, there's been uncharacteristic buildup of vegetation. So thinning from below to re reduce the stand density, following it up with prescribed fire to restore a more frequent surface fire regime can help the forest be more resilient to fire when it comes through. It provides ecosystem services. It's good fire for indigenous culture practices, burning practices, and for any community that's in the forest, it provides community protection. This is win-win. Um, but like I said in the chaparral, there's trade-offs. Um, doing vegetation management in chaparral, it doesn't matter how you look at it, it has ecological consequences. And part of that is because there is no understory in the chaparral. To, to do mechanical vegetation management in chaparral, it involves removing the canopy to either intentionally type convert, which many people do, or intent, unintentionally type convert um, the evergreen shrubland into a grassland. So um, 
this not only removes the uh, native chaparral, but it can actually make the area a bit more flammable because it's introducing a lot more flashy fuels. Um, this is a picture. This was on the front cover of the journal for the California Native Plant Society. And this is uh, just a few months later, somebody did uh, vegetation management of that very same place. Um, and so as a reminder, most destructive fires happen during severe wind conditions. Most homes are not ignited because fire marches right up to the home and burns it down. It's because of millions and millions of embers flying through the air under 40 mile an hour wind conditions. And so we did some research looking at decades of empirical work where fires intersected with fuel breaks and we tried to understand, well, what are the factors most associated with the control of large fires in Southern California? And we uh, followed up our GIS analysis with interviews with firefighters to figure out what was going on in the fires. And we found that the main role of fuel breaks um, is not to stop fires. If it's out in the landscape and there's nobody there, the fuel break is not gonna stop the fire. It might slow it temporarily, but fires um, jump 10 lane freeways, they're gonna jump your fuel break. Instead, it's for safe firefighter access to get in and perform defensive activities. And so um, many times in extreme fire be behavior conditions, it's not safe to put firefighters on those fuel breaks. So the main role for them in Southern California or in wind-driven fires is to be strategically placed surrounding communities so that firefighters can get in and protect the homes. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a couple of folks, um, well, more than a couple, a, bu a bunch of co-authors repeated the analysis that we did about a decade ago and found the exact same, um, same results doing a more, um, you know, more recent contemporary analysis. And they found that, um, I guess, 29% of fuel breaks are effective in Southern California. And um, this is just an illustration of if you're adding prescribed fire into Southern California, um, this again is, is uh, related to the field work that we've been doing. This was the 2021 French fire that burned over mature and immature stands in Kern County. Um, in this fire, it burned over a prescribed fire that occurred 18 years ago in blue here. This was where the prescribed fire was. Well, these two species um, recovered just fine in um, the area that was 55 years old when the fire burned. But in the immature stands, particularly for this Ceanothus species, it was basically extirpated from the site. So that means for this species, if you put a prescribed fire on the landscape, you need at least 18 years to keep fire out of that landscape if you want to retain the evergreen shrubs there. Um, and this is what I call bad fire because it's leading to the elimination of um, the evergreen shrublands and potentially making the landscape more flammable. And in Southern California, we've got a very young landscape. Um, this in map is just showing you in the pink areas um, vegetation that is less than 10 or 20 years old. So if fire comes in in any of these pink areas right now, it could lead to um, the elimination of some of the chaparral species. Um, so the, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the home ignition zone. This, of course, is not directly related to utilities, but I'm going to mention it anyway because it does deal with vegetation. Um, this was pioneered by Jack Cohen of the U.S. Forest Service, who said, we don't have a fire problem. We don't have a landscape scale problem. We've got a home ignition problem. And his idea is that the way to protect communities is not to do management in the landscape, but to focus on the flammability of the structure itself and the defensible space right adjacent to the structure. And I've been doing research for the last 10 or 15 years where we've been looking at homes that have been destroyed in fires and comparing them to homes that have survived fires and asking what are the factors that explain why some structures are destroyed and others are not. And um, in many of these studies, we've looked at factors like building materials, we've looked at defensible space, other things like topography and housing density and other factors. And building materials 
uh, tend to be the most important factors. Um, they have the most significant uh, potential to protect your house. Part of this, of course, is because, you know, what ignites a house is whatever the embers land on. If they can penetrate a gap, if they can somehow get in through um, events, you know, event in your house, that's what causes homes to ignite. But I want to talk about defensible space for a little bit. Um, and this is because there people are getting so scared of fire. There's this big push to keep increasing the distance of defensible space beyond the 100 feet that are required in the fire hazard severity zones right now. Um, there is a strong sentiment that the more you do, the safer you are. Um, the thing is that there really has not been a lot of empirical support for just how much and what kind of defensible space you actually need to provide a significant benefit for your house. So I've been doing studies where I've looked at aerial imagery um, before and after fires to calculate various um, types of metrics and distances associated with what the defensible space was like before the fire, and then comparing it um, with structures destroyed and structures lost. What we found is that um, closer to the house, having defensible space can provide a significant uh, increase of likelihood that your house can survive a fire. But that benefit goes completely away after about um, 60 to 75 feet. In other words, more than 75 feet, if you clear it, it doesn't provide any additional benefit. Um, we recommend 100 feet because firefighters need a safe place to be able to move around if they're going to be getting in and protecting communities. Um, but something I've been doing recently, um, this is just a recent discovery, I haven't published it, but we've been looking at LIDAR data of vegetation uh, conditions at very fine resolution uh, before right, this imagery was flown right before the Woolsey fire. And so this is looking at, at the percentage cover of these vegetation types with destroyed structures and surviving structures in the Woolsey fire. And what you're looking at here is consistent with what you would expect. Destroyed structures had a higher proportion of um, uh, tree cover. They had a slightly lower proportion of grass cover. But the thing that was really interesting is I found that, huh, destroyed structures actually had a higher percentage of bare soil in them, or you know, the, there was a larger percentage cover of soil for destroyed structures. And I asked the folks with the imagery why this might be, because it doesn't make sense from a fire perspective. And they said that it's because soil is often confused with dry grasses. And so the point is that it's possible and the hypothesis is if you clear a lot more, not only may you not be increasing um, the benefit, but you may actually be creating an additional risk by converting the more um, fuel mo higher fuel moisture vegetation to these flashy fuels that may spark and ignite if an ember lands on them. I'm almost finished. Um, this brings me to the next, um, notion, which is there is growing support in the literature for using greenness as a way of reducing fire hazard. Um, there are some studies in Australia that found that green vegetation significantly protected structures. Um, another study in San Diego County uh, found that lightly irrigated native plants reduced fire hazard. Um, this can reduce the cost of clearing the vegetation. Um, it can also help improve aesthetics. And um, so it can have other co-benefits to it. And, you know, there's this increasing idea that there can be benefits to having ember catchers in the landscape, which are basically um, this guy, he was there defending his house. And he said that the green trees next to his house, he saw them um, absorb the embers that were flying through the air. So there's not a lot of empirical study of these yet, but I think it's something that should be looked at. Um, so. Just to summarize what I talked about, wildfire is a geographical issue. It's important to understand the environmental diversity that results in the diversity of natural fire regimes that are being altered in different ways. And as natural fire regimes are altered, this disrupts ecological systems in different ways. 
And these in turn can alter the, the future trajectory of fire um, through invasive species and in different ways that the vegetation conditions are gonna change. There's different pathways to get there. Um, fire regimes are altered for a lot of different reasons and they should all be considered when trying to project how fires and fire risk may occur in the future. Climate is important, but it's not just climate. Um, you should include consideration of other things. And then finally, when looking at solutions and thinking about vegetation management, when you're in forests, this can be a win-win situation for increasing resilience, um, uh, improving or, or you know, less, lessening severe fire behavior. But in the shrublands, it could actually lead to a conversion of greener shrubs into um, flammable, flashy vegetation. And so, you know, in a lot of areas, having more of a focus on the structure itself instead of doing management of vegetation in the landscape and shrublands might be um, a wiser way to go about it. Um, and I didn't talk about equity, even though I've done some research on it, so I won't talk about that. Um, but, you know, all of these really are about the fact that fire is a geographical issue, and that's why fire regimes are altered for different reasons. And this is why we need to consider different solutions for different areas, because what's appropriate in one region might be destructive in another. Um, and so I'm giving you some lessons that I've learned, but really this is part of a thousand smaller lessons. And I know the more you learn, the more you know you need to learn. And I know that there's a lot more that we need to learn about fire. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, board member Seifert, that I, I took away a long list of possible um, uh, conclusions that could maybe inform some, some takeaways. Um, I'd like to, before I ask my long list of, of cat, catalyzing conversation questions, does, is there any, um, any board members that have any first questions? Board member Mader? So first off, I, 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 well, I want to lodge a complaint that you went first in uh, uh, these papers, uh, because uh, to follow to follow this, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, okay. Second, um, you know, uh, one of the takeaways I'm coming away with uh, from this is, you know, it might be possible, especially in Northern California, uh, through, um, you know, the use of fire from the the the, the restoring the natural uh, 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 rhythms of, of fire to to potentially make you know the 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 forest uh, less <coughs> capable of high velocity fires of, of the fires that, uh, that that we saw that led to the tragedy at, at, at Paradise and uh, you know when you see the overlays you can see vast areas that potentially could be removed from high fire threat district areas uh, if it was possible during the Santa Ana winds to take previous forests that behaved like it did at Paradise and through natural uh, through through reintroduction of the the natural bird rhythms uh, reduce those fire those forest capability to burn so quickly is is that somewhere we could potentially get to? Well. Part of that is kind of complex. Can you hear me? I can't see my mute button. Yes. Okay. Yes. Part of that's also complex because, um, you know, some of these forests are turning into chaparral because they're burning in such large areas of high severity fire that, um, you know, when wind driven fires come through, you can see that um, the ability for uh, previous fires to limit fire behavior. Um, is less effective. Now, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that it's partially true, but with a lot of asterisks, because it really depends on the conditions at the site. It depends on whether you're dealing with a, um, extreme fire behavior and wind condition. So, you know, I think it's important in these areas that have burned in recent years. And by the way, the campfire was started in grass, um, and a lot of it did not burn through forest. Um, but is is to monitor the conditions and to keep looking at um, how are the forests returning and to keep doing research on to what extent are these areas that are burning now um, when they do reburn, 
what is the behavior of the fires that are coming back through so we have a better understanding of it. So I think um, it's what you're saying is is definitely possible. It just needs to be followed through. Thank you. Other board members? Yeah, uh, board member Seifert, that, that gave me more questions than answers. <laughs> write, them, write them down, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> but that was that, that was outstanding. I, I mean, I I instantly uh, honed in on: Do we even have the ability, right, to obligate the the utilities to manage, right, the landscape so that it truly, through veg management, reduces the effect of wildfire? Um, can we even sustain being able to, if it was possible to reintroduce native uh, vegetation, uh, would they be able to ultimately sustain that? Um, you, that it, it was interesting for the maturity models, right? 18 years, 55 years, that's a, that's a generation. And um, I, I know in California, we want everything fixed yesterday. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a commitment and and we're not going to always get it right and it's and in this arena i mean especially northern california where a, a number of the board members are from uh you address that but really that that, that chaparral and, and the grass the invasive grass is more in the central uh part of california and the upper southern part along in and of course in the San Diego area, and a lot of the burn patterns or, or historical burn patterns have already been destroyed. And I, I, I love that one slide where you could clearly almost chronicle mm -hmm. what it looks like. How do we get it back? Well, this is, uh, I mean, thank you for your, for your wise comments, board member Porter, um, because it, it really is, we, we want a solution. Vegetation management looks like a solution. Um, there, you know, there are people who, who really readily come out and say, well, it's the only thing we can do. So that's what we're doing because it looks good. Um, and there's just unfortunately so many limitations with it. And we can't get the chaparral back, um, which is what I was talking about with the ecology. It, you know, chaparral evolved in an area that had very infrequent fire. And Therefore, it does not have, you know, it does not have the plant traits to be able to recover once it's gone because it doesn't regenerate in between fire. And, you know, even if it were possible to regenerate, it doesn't disperse very far. And so short of um, Herculean efforts to try to go in and plant chaparral, once it's gone, it's gone. And, um, and you know, even if you don't care about ecology, this has implications for having a really flammable landscape and as many of you know, you know, most firefighters have died in grass fires, not forest fires. Grass is dangerous. Um, and, you know, even in the forests, uh, you know, I'm talking about the win-win situation. But right now, in those areas that have had forest conditions altered, they're altered to the point that just bringing in fire is not a safe solution. Because those, those forests are such that if you bring a fire in, without having thinned some of the vegetation, it's gonna result in a very high severity fire that can result in profound vegetation change. And, you know, as I, as I was just um, saying, you know, in a wind-driven situation, um, it can be difficult for any managed vegetation to actually help conditions. Um, what it really is for is for firefighter defense. You know, firefighters, go in and they use those areas to take advantage of short-term changes in fire behavior to control the fire. I want um, I want to bring in a couple of points before we run out of time. I think we're we're at but I want to we have more minutes if we can. Um, uh, I, 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 I find it very compelling, the uh, fire regime map that you and John Keeley have put 
together a different app from our from the vegetation extent app in general. Um, and I think that there's some there's some learnings there to identify. It looks like my I've been told my internet is unstable. I hope you can hear me. Um, that there's an opportunity there to investigate fire regime that influences fire risk and should have something to do with um, the high fire threat zones and the tiers for risk. Um, I so want to point out that what I, so um, when I look to some of the steps, they're very complicated and, and they're also general, right? We, we talk about how fire in general is, in is human caused minus lightning. Human causes are um, everything, like from cigarette butts to cars to um, utility lines. And there's the separate, you know, we hear a lot that there that the rate of fires from utilities are so much smaller than everything else. But what what we do know now is that from from your presentation is that every small fire that is hitting some chaparral and converting is converting that space to grass inst practically instantaneously. And so every and we know that the utilities also have many, many, many small ignitions that always that get contained um, from you know, just from small infrastructure failure and is, is repaired quickly. But what's interesting to me in that is that the, every single one of those very small ignitions that are then repaired are contributing to this convert type conversion change and thus may be influencing greater risk in their service territory or along the line in a way that they're not aware. And I, so the complicated action beyond that is how can, you know, how can, how can hardening be prioritized in places where some of that conversion is already happening to help reduce the rate of the rate of risk and the rate of change and to identify that every small action in the chaparral environment is actually a tremendous action. Um, I'll pause there for a second. Do you have any comments? Um, I'd like to just mention one thing is that um you know, to, to sort of, there are some chaparral, like the re-sprouting species of chaparral, they are not as sensitive to short return intervals. Um, so it's not necessarily a given that a fire is going to um, extirpate the chaparral. It's just something that's been accumulatively occurring. So I don't want to, um, you know, what you're saying is correct, that there is a, there is a real and ongoing risk of it. But um, there are some cases where you know, those fires are not going to cause harm. I just want to make sure that I'm not over saying what I <laughs> was Thank done. you. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Hey, J J uh, Chairman oh. Block, um, yeah. uh, based on your comment, I, I, I wanted to make a comment to which we are, you, you, I think you're quite rightly are beginning to think of concentrate uh, an effort to concentrate uh, risk uh, wildfire or, or spark reduction um, you know, be it hardening or undergrounding in those areas that where um, we've seen this kind of topography change to a more higher risk uh, fire. But inversely, the reason why I asked my original questions uh, to um, board member Seifert was if there is a way to reduce the risk of fire by returning natural yeah. uh, uh, forest practices, then the, you might be able to redirect uh, fire hardening that you are planning on doing uh, up to the utilities to other areas to higher priority areas. That's very interesting. And I've, I've been thinking about that proactive replanting, which is something that I think, you know, the, the world at large citizens at large need to participate in in some way globally. Um, what is what is our responsibility in that of that conversation in this board and to the utilities? Um, and that's a complicated conversation too. And speaking of which, actually, um, Alex, I know you, or Dr. Seifert, I know you are familiar with some reintroduction or reseeding or regeneration efforts by utilities post fire and their successes and failures. Can you speak to that a little bit? Where where the shortcomings might lie, as a as a warning? Yeah, you know, I actually don't know that much about what they're reseeding with. Um, so. You know, it used to be that in fire burned areas, they they actually intentionally reseeded it with these invasive grasses. Um, so I just, you know, I think it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, an exact 
type of species, but generally native species that have higher fuel moisture um, tend to be less flammable in certain circumstances. So, so you know, just um, you know, finding a palette of plants that are less flammable. Oaks, for example, if um, you know, and and I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't claim to have this expertise, but you know, I know in a lot of areas people are using oaks, maybe like scrub oaks as ember catchers. And that's generally advisable in your opinion? Yes, I think, but I I would not um, even begin to start telling you which plants to plant because I don't know those answers. But there is some research, I think there is some research on that and some advice and you referenced, you referenced some observational research that showed that lightly irrigating some of this native yeah. vegetation. Yeah. So it's not just the planting, but it sounds like timing and the tending to that planting strategically matters and then will be dependent on where irrigation is possible and things like, and rates of irrigation, et cetera. Like it sounds like there's like a tremendous amount of nuance here to be learned um, and, and identified. Yes, I am. Um... You know, I would say that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. This is an area of of just um, just beginning research on looking at the different plants. Um, so I like to think of solutions that um, can have the benefit, the most benefit without causing the most harm. In other words, you know, going out and permanently converting something to grass is likely to have long term consequences. Whereas, you know, experimenting with planting a different, you know, places that have already been converted and experimenting with planting something else there might have um, lower risk of consequence. And those are just hypothetical examples. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, and this is um, Vice Chair Feldman. Again, thank you, board member Dr. Seifert for this great presentation. There's so much to think about. And my takeaway is that there, um, does there need to be just an education process to know that there's a lot to think about? That's a great, that's a great point. That's a really great point. Indeed. I think there's a lot to be, a lot to be taken in here in terms of how it's presented to the, you know, the training was one of the primary um, components identified in this utility vegetation management scoping um, conversation. And I think there's something about this that we should we should frame, um, you know, and and for that, um, you know, there's the, the vegetation conversion introduction of native species in a particular way. Um, you know, all, all kinds of, of ways we might conditionally describe some of that um, that education and some of it, I think, you know, I see sometimes there are efforts to do broader vegetation management by the utilities than is what what is required. And so, you know, maybe a decision would simply be if it's chaparral to not uh, go in and do more landscape level clearance of chaparral. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's it's sort of like it's not a proactive thing, but to put to stop doing something that has the potential to cause harm is also an action to protect what we've got or to prevent you know basically is to prevent an area from being even more flammable right there's the, you know the thing i always talk about is you know the the higher bulk vegetation like chaparral does generate the embers that creates the higher intensity fire it's just that when that chaparral is interspersed with grasses the more that they're interspersed you've got that combination of flammability and the chaparral embers that can, you know, keep the fire going forward. Speaking of embers, there was a conversation in the risk modeling working group, a uh, researcher who's trying to uh, forward the research in ember behavior, modeling ember behavior quantitatively and ignitability of homes, which is a tremendous area of research. It's going to take a long time to inform fire behavior models through communities. Um, 
but it sounds like there's a lot in the research that can qualitatively describe, for instance, construction age of a res of a residential area or an urban in a, a developed area and its vulnerability to embers from past fires. Um, and I know, you know, the it's a it's a complicated question because I think the utilities also their their main drive is to prevent the fire, not to spend a whole lot of time understanding consequence, although it is part of the conversation. Um, is there is there more research there that we can draw on for the observational um, effects of of embers and the vegetation that is influencing that? Yeah. I mean, there are, um, I don't know who you were speaking with, but I, I know, you know, others who are, who are, you know, doing modeling experiments, looking at ember flow and looking at ignitability of structures. <clears throat> One of the, 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 the way I've gone about my research before is I do it empirically in that I, um, after the fire has occurred, I look at the characteristics of destroyed structures versus the characteristics of surviving structures. And that, um, you know, because it's a real wildfire situation that accounts for all of the things that happen in a fire. And there are certain things that come out as being relatively more influential than others. Um, you know, like the having multiple or double pane windows, really important. Vent screens, really important. Um, eaves, really important. And so um, I think that there is you know, in terms of the ember modeling, I know there are other folks that do it. I, and I think maybe, you know, one thing is to understand how far the embers go and under different conditions, what's generating the most embers. Some things are different, difficult to understand um, because you can only measure it in an actual wildfire condition. And when, when you've got a really bad wind-driven fire, nobody's out measuring it because you can't safely do it. Um, and then the other, you know, another uh, area of investigation that some of my colleagues are working on is wind drag. Um, you know, different vegetation structural types under different wind conditions can more or less um, enhance the speed and the drying effect of wind as it goes through uh, vegetated landscapes. And that can you know, have another, there can also be unintentional consequences. And there's a balancing act is, you know, what are the trade-offs of having reduced fire behavior versus having increased wind flow doesn't matter at all. Um, we don't necessarily know that yet. Okay. Um. I'd like to ask the, my fellow board members if there are any um, additional comments or questions at this time. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, public comment, last one. Last one. <laughs> it's the thing that I can't really keep track of. Thank you, Joy. Um, uh, Rain, are there any comments um, from Zoom or the phone? At present, there are no public comments. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, any email or otherwise? No, there are, <clears throat> there are no public comments or questions in the email. Okay. So in conclusion, I would like to ask my fellow board members to think about um, this uh, the conversation as a whole that we've had today that energy safety is host is hosting a series of conversations around what are the best practices in addressing all these things climate change but best vegetation management practices risk modeling how does that inform um, the vegetation management practices how does how do does the consequence of of uh, utility hardening and um, and their recovery efforts uh, influence, you know, the rate making process and how we might be able to cons to introduce recommendations that could help influence that process. Um, I'd like to continue this conversation 
um, write up some ideas and uh, present them to energy safety. Um, we don't have a time frame for that yet, but we intend to, as a board, participate in some of these scoping meetings as best we can. And um, we'll contribute where we, you know, where we best can with our expertise. Um, Vice Chair Feldman, I'd like to ask you um, if there's anything else that I'm missing that we should cover today. Uh, thank you, Chair Block. Uh, I, ju I just want to uh, express my uh, gratitude for you uh, setting up this meeting and bringing this conversation to the board. It's really important that we have this information before us. And it's equally important that we figure, uh, we determine a pathway where we can be most effective following uh, Ms. Morgan's earliest invitation to bring this material to energy safety. And since our council was present, do it in a way that meets all our legal public meeting requirements as well as our um, vaguely keen grouping. So, you know, we have a, we've thought about this a lot. We're now implementing this approach and thank you very much for setting us on this path. Thank you very much. I really look forward to continuing the conversation with everybody here. Um, with that, I thank everyone for staying a little bit late. This is a really important conversation to me, <laughs> to the state of California. Um, uh, thank you all for participating. For those that have uh, attended from the public, um, thank you very much for participating in the meeting and being present. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, and provide us comments and questions. Um, you can find us on our uh, the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board website. Thank you very much, Rain, for holding the meeting together and keeping keeping us um, technically connected um, and making it possible. Jonathan and Marianne, well, we couldn't have done this without you. And as we end, I'd like to thank the members. Uh, let's see. Um, we'd like to uh, see you all at our next board meeting, which I believe is June 13th. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Chair Block, uh, I so move. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Any objections? All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, talk to you all soon. Have a good day.